Hey everybody, Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. We are bringing it around. We do this once a year, every year, because it just so happens that me and my buddy Eris Pina, who is a CompuBox operator, but also, more importantly, boxing history fanatic like myself, but also a fellow International Boxing Hall of Fame voter. Bro, I mean, first of all, how's it going? Second of all, yeah, holy man. shit. <laughs> How's everything, man? It's been a little bit. Yeah, man. Had to take a little break, you know. Man, it's just like the with the weather comes <laughs> crazy shit every single time. The weather starts to get all cold and whatnot. And we just had to take a little bit of a break. But we're back, and it's that time of year, dude. We just turned in our International Boxing Hall of Fame ballot. So every single year, we got to kind of give a little discussion about the ballot and which way we voted and whatnot. I mean, I guess kind of justify it, discuss it, whatever. Yeah, I mean. It's that always time an year. exciting time, man. Um, it comes really quick, too. First, uh, the Hall of Fame induction weekend in Canastota, which finally took place for the first time in, um, what was it, three years uh, this past June. And that was a great celebration. Everybody was really happy to be there. Um, it was a huge event. You know, they combined all the classes, all that stuff. Um, that being said, like you just said, um, a few months later, come October, that's when the ballots start coming out, the very beginning of October. People start posting on Twitter, hey, I got my Hall of Fame ballot, I got my Hall of Fame ballot. You know, it's exciting to post about it, especially if you're a new uh, a newbie, so to speak, in terms of voting, because, like, it's a, it's a pretty cool honor. You know what I mean? You get to have, like, a chance to vote who's going to be in a box of Hall of Fame. Um, that being said, um, it, this year was kind of a lean year, I would try, I would say, as, a, as opposed to others, you know what I mean? Like, the the past classes there's always been like a few people that just like stand out in terms of like star studded. You had Floyd Mayweather, you had Bernard Hopkins, you had Roy Jones, Shane Mosley, RJ Ward. Um but I'm sure I'm missing a couple of names there, but you know what I mean. Like there was Rafael, oh, excuse me, Juan Manuel Marquez. It was just the name after name after name. It, it was star studded. And that was combining three classes, but each class had like just huge names right there, recognizable ones. That being said, there's, you know, um, when it comes to voting and stuff like that, sometimes there's going to be years that, well, whereas there's a lot of deserving guys on that ballot, there's not like absolute shoe wins that someone's going to see automatically be like, okay, I'm going to check mark that, but, you know, there's going to be ones where you have to think about it. That so much, um, I would say, was this year. You know what I mean? There's a couple of names I'm sure I have a feeling people are definitely going to vote for, but you also had to think um, because they weren't just a slam dunk. There was others that potentially on past years you would have like skipped over because of the slam dunks. And now you're thinking to yourself, well, I might actually give them a shot. So Yeah. Yeah. It's it's pretty interesting. Yeah, and in the the process has come a long way, especially yeah. since you started, because you started voting several years before me. You were the youngest Hall of Fame voter, you know, which much to the ire of uh many of the other voters. I think that record, <laughs> still stand. My, that record might still stand, bro. I have no idea. I was 19 years old when I first started voting for the Boxing Hall of Fame, so I I don't I can't tell you any other teenagers that started around that time either. You know what I mean? I'm definitely not. I'm obviously not the youngest anymore. People years younger than me that vote now, be involved with the BWAA or whatever. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I was 19 in uh, 2004. And when I got my ballot, I was in October. My birthday's in October, but I sent it in right before my birthday. It happened like two weeks later. So, yeah, I was 19. And um, that was for the class of 05, which was McGuigan, Terry Norris, and um, Bobby Chacon as like the three, as the three main guys. So, I mean, yeah, say what you want about McGuigan. The infamous McGuigan year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. But... Bobby Chacon obviously was a definite um, deserving candidate, and so is uh, Terry Norris. But you're absolutely right, Pat. It has come a long way because back then when I first started voting, um, the Hall of Fame class was you were able to vote for 10 guys, as opposed to now where you only, where you only vote for five guys. Also, the ballot was much more bigger for the modern class. Over the years, they've realized that they had to like kind of like split things apart. So like the, what I mean is that like the Hall of Fame – how they do it with voting is that they they you know go into categories. You have like the pioneers, you have um, non participants, old timers, um, modern class, so so on and so forth. So back when I first started voting back in two thousand four, 
um, the modern class, it was only modern, old timer, and pioneer. So old timer was no no um, later after like 1940 something or whatever, right? And everybody else after that was in the modern class. That became kind of a log jam for a lot of guys after a while because the modern class was just, that was such a vast, you yeah. know, amount of years. So you had guys like, <clears throat> you know, Lou Salica, Sixto Escobar, um, Lloyd Marshall, Holman Williams, uh, a bunch of others that were just sitting there. Whereas whenever a new name would come up, like a Terry Norris or, a, you know, a, a Toro Gotti or whoever it may be, and someone would just be more inclined to checkmark them as opposed to doing research. And over the years, you know, more and more um, historians and other people were making comments like Lee Groves and others were making suggestions saying, hey, you need to split this up because these guys are never going to get in. And all it's going to do is just cause like more of a log jam when more names being brought in and potential other names who deserve to be on the ballot can't fit in because these guys aren't being moved. So fast forward, probably like a decade or so later, and finally things started, you know, wheels started turning into motion. Um, the Hall of Fame decided well, it was only a few years ago. I think you probably started voting, Pat, right around that time. Um, I had I had yeah. the first year was like the it, right? was like the kind of transition, and then my second year voting was the one we have now. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so what it was is that they decided, okay, we're going to split the old timer category up, which was actually what they should have done, you know, originally. So they had like the old timers, the original, like the OGs, which again no later than the 40s for their last fight. And then you have the modern old timers where their last fight can be, no, their last fight can be no later than 1988. So that's how that split up. All the guys now that were in the modern category are now in the old timer category. And the modern category now is filled with obviously any name after 1989 and, and so forth. And that created now a much better chance for other guys for the old timers now to get a chance to get into the hall of fame and also to add new names to the modern category, which has been done since then. Yeah. Um, I, I was kind of long winded. I hope I didn't confuse anyone, but that's... no, I mean, there needs to be some explanation, especially because every year that we do this, um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to play like we get like, you know, thousands of comments, but every single year that we do this, whether I post my ballot on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, Every year, there's always somebody who asks, why didn't you vote for so-and-so? Oh, well, how come so-and-so wasn't on the ballot? And it's like, you know, neither you nor I have any sort of control over who's going on the ballot. You know, we don't have any say over any of this kind of stuff, you know, and, and all we're doing is we're putting up, you know, our votes. And mm -hmm. so it, it helps, I think, to explain the process a little bit, to explain the, the thought process behind why these people are getting put on and why the things are getting split up the way they're getting split up. And also the like the the protocols and criteria for voting, whereas before I think it was they had to be um, a fighter had to be retired for five years and now it's three. Right. right. I'm pretty sure it's three now. And so that obviously opened it up quite a bit. And also on top of that, it opened up kind of a conundrum for fighters who were retired and came back after three years, which, you know, inevitably either happened or is going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, they've changed a number of things. Oh, and also the amount of guys you're able to vote for. Because back in the day, yeah. when I first started, you were able to vote for 10 guys, yep. which is a pretty big, decent amount. And now it's been split to five. Yeah, and it's, I mean... I don't know. It, they they do it the way they do it, and I don't really. I'll just adhere to whatever voting rules they give me for the most part. I'm not gonna. I don't care. But um, it does make it a fairly interesting process, especially for the newer fight, like or the more recent fighters. And I could imagine there's probably some sort of pressure, um, even if it's passive pressure, to get some of these guys who are still alive in while they're still alive and while they're still you know, in good spirits and in good health and whatnot too. So I, I get that. And I get that there needs to be, <clears throat> there needs to be updating with the way that things work now with social media, et cetera. So anyway, it's a pretty cool process though. I'm still excited about it. I know you are. And, uh, you know, pretty much I get, I get the reason why everybody's always posting their ballot and stuff like that. Cause it's, it's cool. It's cool it to is. know that you have some sort of say in these fighters being honored. You know, that's, that's an honor for me for sure. So yeah, it's, it's cool to be able to go over it. That thing, man. I was, just, I remember showing it to everybody in college. They don't, no one knew uh -huh. what I was talking about. I went to school in Maine. 
no one had main watch boxing unless they knew Joey Gamash. And um, <laughs> I, I was just the most hyped person on the planet. I just knew I was doing something really important. And like you said, to the chagrin of a bunch of old dudes who were pissed off about it. But like, I, you know, and then each year, the same thing. You just get in, you see the names and you pull over the ones that are new and you see the old ones and you keep on hoping that the guys that you vote for eventually get in. And you get a good feeling too when a guy that you vote for and you're not even sure if it's going to be a slam dunk or not. Like, if you vote for Floyd Mayweather, you know he's going to get in because everybody's going to vote for him too. Like, that's not, that's anticlimactic. But like, if you say you vote for like someone like Holman Williams, like I did year after year after year, and then finally you see that he gets in, and you feel like you're, you know, you are part of that process. So, <clears throat> yeah, no question, dude. You know, and and on top of that, there are going to be a couple of fighters we're talking about today on the ballot now that are kind of in that same same vein. Obviously, not a Holman Williams per se, and they don't go back that yeah, far. Yeah, yeah. But uh, fighters that should get more recognition than they get, and should get a better shot at getting in than they get. But there's a big, uh, the biases, the kind of main biases that we usually see, I think, when it comes to the voting, for better or worse, is there's a recency bias. So the more recent a fighter has been around, there seems to be a little bit more of a kind of a, you know, a magnet Mm -hmm. to that fighter. And also... um, definitely there's there's clearly a an american bias absolutely no question and um there's also a bias against a lot of smaller fighters a number of those smaller weight class fighters have had to wait several years to finally get in or get pushed into that old timer category to get in which sucks but hopefully we'll be able to kind of you know offset that a little bit this year like you said it's kind of interesting this year because there aren't quite as many clear standout names that maybe name two and three as far as who gets inducted could be kind of interesting well it really is because if you look at the ballot um there's a lot of names that a lot of big names and but you wouldn't think of them as like hall of famers so to speak because so some of their biggest fights were losses as as opposed to wins. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is a person I didn't vote for this year, but someone that could actually slip in because of it being like a lean year. And um, we talked about it in our like group chat the other day with um, our friend Corey Erdman and uh, Gray, but Gray Johnson, um, Melger Taylor, for example. Melger Taylor is a guy that's been on the ballot for a number of years now and no one's ever really talked about, you know, there's a few people there that have talked about voting for him, yada, yada, yada. But when you think about a guy like Melger Taylor, um, had he won that fight with Chavez as opposed to being stopped, you know, with the two seconds left or whatever, um, he probably would have been in the Hall of Fame years ago. You know, I mean, this is a guy that was at the top of his game and near the top three pound for pound list for of at least, you know, three to four years. And then had his, you know, peak against Chavez, um, had some really, really good wins on his ledger, including a big one against Buddy McGirt um, to win the title, who's in the Hall of Fame as well. And a host of others, former Olympic gold medalist, you know, very accomplished career. And by most accounts, you know, <clears throat> most people wouldn't even bat an eye if he got if he got inducted in, especially if he got that win in. But as you, you know, as it's remembered, that's what's kind of holding him back. But in a year like this, if you really have to like really look into his record, look at a person like Antonio Tarver's record or, you know, someone of the elk like that, they might, you know, you might be more inclined to give them a check mark as opposed to other years. Yeah, I was actually just looking at Antonio Tarver's name on the ballot, too, and thinking that same thing, going like, yeah, that could be one. Because Tarver, you know, I mean, as much as it is easy, it is to bash on Tarver. And, you know, he has a lot of controversy near the end of his career with uh, the failed drug tests with steroids and other banned substances. and all this other stuff. But when Tarver, you know, starting with his um, knockout of Roy Jones Jr. And that run he had at light heavyweight. I mean, that was a really, really solid run, even before the Jones fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, the like, Harding fight. Harding fight, beating yep. uh, Montel Griffin. And then first, you know, um, taking Roy the distance and arguably winning that one, knocking Roy smooth out in the rematch, um, beating Roy in the third fight, and then going on his run after that. I mean, Tarver had a hell of a, you know, he had a really, really accomplished run. Pretty underrated when you think about it. Yeah, I could I could see somebody voting for somebody like him. And and I, based on the ballots that I saw, I didn't see a ton, but I the ones that I did see, Probably. there were some kind of, there were some names on there that like, that I didn't vote for that I'm like, okay, but I could see those guys getting in though, just because they're, 
the the name value you know the the name value seems to kind of go quite a bit too here i'll i'll just name off who's on the ballot real quick just sure. to give people an idea so they know and um, you know they've probably seen it but just in case they have not arthur abraham yuri arbachkov uh jorge arce Polly ayala nigel ben tim bradley buyani bungu uh ivan calderon yoel casamayor sochi delata uh diego corrales chris eubank oslino freitas Carl Frotch, Leo Gomez, uh, Ricky Hatton, Gennaro Hernandez, Christian, Michael Kessler, Santos, Lassiar, um, Rocky Lockridge, Miguel Laura, Rafael Marquez, Henry Mask, uh, uh, Darius Mikulczewski, Sun Kill Moon, uh, Michael Moore, Omar Narvaez, Orsebek Navarov, Michael Nunn, Sven Atke, Vinny Paz, <laughs> Alberto Roman, Gianfranco Rossi, Samuel Serrano, Antonio Tarver, Meldrick Taylor, Fernando Vargas, Esro Vasquez, Wilfredo Vasquez, uh, Ratanapol Solvorapin, and Pong Saklek Wong Chung Kim. So, so names on that ballot, bro, are just like there's a lot. There's, there's a, a lot. lot of names, and there's a like, you know, when people will say for a, like, why isn't so and so on the ballot? You know, and you could probably make a valid argument when you look at that and you hear that GM Franco Rossi is on the ballot. As opposed to someone like maybe, I don't know, Marvin Johnson, Iran Barkley. Yeah. <laughs> one of those guys, but it's like, I don't know. It is. Yeah. I mean, I get it. And I mean, on some level, uh, I'm pretty sure that his claim to fame is I think that he still holds the junior middleweight defense record. Okay. But it's not a great list of names <laughs> and he didn't unify. So it's kind of like, mm. You know, it's it's one of those things where you almost kind of look at it with all due respect to him, like a Fernando Vargas type of record. And it's like the record, he he faced a lot of very good names. Some of his best wins could have been losses, though. And kind of he has a good asterisk -y claim to fame of like youngest junior middleweight champion or something like that, you know. And it's like, that's great. But is that one single kind of, you know, is that enough? I don't know about that. So that's that's but that's that's what you got to argue, you know what I mean? That's what you got to discuss. So um yeah, I mean there's a lot of there are other names too. Tim Bradley is one that you brought up. I think that that uh most likely is going to be one that a lot of people vote for this year. Absolutely, man. Um <clears throat> Bradley was a very popular name for a number of years. He's still fresh. His career is still very fresh because he only retired only a few years ago. Um, accomplished a lot in his career. I mean, his, his record speaks for itself. Didn't shy away from trying to duck anybody, um, fought whoever needed to be, uh, whoever was out there. Um, un unfortunately, not his fault because it's not like he can pick, you know, a decision like that. He still gets criticized about the first Pacquiao fight, but Again, even though he lost that fight, he got the decision. You know, it's not his fault what happened with it. And so if you look at that, but then you also look at, like, you know, the wins that he actually, like, really, his body of work besides the Pacquiao one. I mean, from scoring a big upset against Junior Witter, coming out of nowhere in that one. Um, but even before that, he was scheduled to fight. Like an eliminator or something like that before he ended up fighting Witter. So he ends up beating Witter. Um fights Kendall Holt soon after that comes off the deck in a fight like remember he almost got knocked oh, into the man. Like, what yeah. a knock that was massive like he got like turned around and like you know zombied and shit and got up and at yeah. one point when Holt hit him with that knockdown Holt looked at him like okay like that's it because most guys would be fucking done from that type of shot but Bradley's credit he got up he scraped back and won a very very clear decision and that ended up becoming like a trademark for him is that like you could hurt Bradley you can dog him a little bit but that guy was going to be in your ass he was just he was going to be in better condition than you. I'm mean, obviously he had like well, a fucking 40 pack and um, <laughs> just, and he was, and he was like an underrated boxer too, just besides yeah, like that, that fool was training just on fucking vegan shit and hatred for his father. Like that was basically yes. all it was. <laughs> and um, yeah, dude, he, he went on a, a very, very tremendous run around that time. Uh, you think about it, like off the, I'm not, a, I don't have his record up. I'm bringing it up right now, a box rec, but um, after the whole fight, like he fought, um, who was it? Nate Campbell, who was still mm -hmm. the lightweight champion, still a very credible name, a little past his peak, but that was a big fight on Showtime. And before the, uh, the cut eye, Bradley was routing him. Like that was an easy whooping for him. Um, 
Now, okay, now that I brought it up, uh, Lamont Peterson was his next fight. Now, again, that was like one of those fights that everybody was just like, oh man, this is huge and everything like that. Bradley Peterson was 27 and 0 at that fight, and Bradley whooped him. Um, he moved up. I worked the fight on HBO against Abregu, and then the same thing against Devon Alexander, which infamously was held at the Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan, home of WrestleMania 3. <laughs> and, um, you know, very strange night, very strange affair, but nonetheless, a very important fight. Well, and it, it, what I remember, I remember it very clearly, actually. A lot of people wanted that fight and called for it, rightly so, because it was like, you know, two. Yeah. I, I don't remember. I think Alexander was undefeated at the time. He was. And, and I remember it was like, all right, well, these are, you know, this is the matchup to make or whatever, you know, because it was a division that had just started kind of barely thinning out a little bit at 140. And so some of the guys were going up to 147 and blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, and it made sense to match Devin Alexander and Tim Bradley. And it seemed like it was going to be a good fight. You know, Devin Alexander had a, a style where he was pretty offensive. And then Tim Bradley was come forward, kind of swarming style should be good. And it wound up being an, a, just a terrible fight. But then on top of it being a terrible fight, there was like a chunk of writers who would not shut the fuck up about it being a bad fight for like two years. It was like, yeah, I know. And sometimes then, like, it happens. Sometimes fights aren't that good. That was at, like in Detroit and that like, you know, the fight that happened at the Pontiac Silver Dome. Like, what would have happened over there? And every, I don't know. The whole promotion was a fiasco. I get it. I think that was Gary Shaw's thing, wasn't it? I sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling he was behind it for some reason. But anyways, regardless of all that, that was still a huge win. And Bradley was a dominant force yeah. in that fight. Like Alexander was looking good in his previous fights. I think he had just knocked the shit out of um uh, Is that Juan after Juan Urongo? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caught him with that massive uppercut and shit. Huge yeah. one. And then you saw him flex it after the fight. Remember, like, you know, and he had that big ass bicep, and rightfully so, people were hyped about it. Like this, you know, Alexander looked like the real deal. Bradley had a chip on his shoulder and was ready to fight him. And, you know, that was a big fight. But the whole thing was a fiasco. And it ending abruptly with a, you know, cut-eye um, technical decision was kind of fitting for the whole thing. But, again, um, soon after that, that's when um, <clears throat> he fights a faded version of Joel Casamayor. Stops him, but that's still a very good name on his record. Casamayor is on the ballot for the health. How for the Hall of Fame, and he was a hell of a fighter. And then after the fiasco with the first Pacquiao fight, go ahead. Was that the one where Casimir tested positive for weed? After this one, Might yeah. Have been. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, yeah, I think that was the one where he tested positive for weed. I would smoke with Casimir. Of course, he's a trainer now in Las Vegas, by the way. So your chances there. I, yeah, I got, I got, I got to keep that in mind then. <laughs> 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 Definitely, I bet you that'd be awesome. Um, Fuck yeah! But after the Pacquiao fight, and like, think about that man. That was that was as bad as you could possibly imagine. Bradley clearly lost that fight. That became one of the biggest controversial decisions of the era. Um, that was during the Hall of Fame weekend, actually. Now looking at the date, that was uh, June. Yeah, that was bad, and, uh, dude, I remember that. So that night, did you watch that? Were you there live? No, I I watched it live, but I wasn't there. Okay. Um. That was at the Hall of Fame. We didn't, I think that the people that went to the banquet dinner that night, they watched it at wherever it was held. And I just went to Graziano's to go party. So when I can't, when I was outside afterwards, like, you know, uh, later on at night and people started trickling back after the fight, going to Graziano's, everybody looked pissed off. I just saw all these angry faces around. I was like, the fuck happened? Because I wasn't even looking to see who won the fight. I didn't, you know, I was having a good time. And Everyone's just like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Boxing's dead. That's what I like. Like, dudes are about to start fist fighting. And I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? What happened? And then you realize quickly Pacquiao got, like, the worst hosing you could have possibly imagined. You know, like, it's something unfathomable to the point of, like, uh, Tyrone Everett getting screwed in Philadelphia against Alfredo Escalera type shit. Like, just really, really bad. And there was a few people that, you know, that were arguing that Brad, that they thought Bradley should have won the fight and dudes wanted to fist fight them for that. Like, it was crazy. <laughs> but anyways, you know, and then the whole scene, too, of Bradley being wheelchaired out because, like, his ankles were hurt or something and he was all messed up in the fight. Just It just didn't look good for him. It didn't. It really, really didn't. But to his credit, and his credit, this is a hell of a thing he did, his very next fight, he took on a juggernaut 
named Ruslan Provotnikov and provided one of the best fights I have ever seen in my life. I, it's just you don't often see a fight like, you know, sometimes people talk about like, oh, it's a slugfest or back and forth fight. And it's like, you know, it's it almost can never live up to what you're talking about. It, it almost never can. You know, you watch it and it's like, ah, it was a slugfest for like, you know, 45 seconds total of the entire fight. But don't get me wrong. Those 45 seconds were great. But every so often there's a fight where like, you know, there's extended periods of time where motherfuckers are just chucking and like and it's like almost like they just don't care like what's coming at them you know what i mean it doesn't happen that often especially at that level and then that fight it did there were some times like that what was it around two or three whenever tim bradley was like unconscious basically up against the ropes and they're just like you know it's like holy shit i remember that being so thrilling like edge of your seat shit like oh my it's, god you know it, that was insane and that was like bradley trying to prove a point at that point too because he knew he heard all the heckles he heard people talking a lot of shit about him after the pacquiao fight and he i think he was trying to prove to himself that he was like you know what? i'm going to take this guy out and show you that i am a bad motherfucker and um it almost backfired on him because in a fight that he probably should have boxed and used his head and not gone in there to the wild, you know, trying to slug it out with an absolute maniac like Provodnikov who just ate punches for breakfast and thought it was fun to do stuff like this. Um, You know, that definitely wouldn't have taken years off his career like that. But, hey, the provider this one an incredible fight in the entertainment of what it was. So um, I saw I saw Tim Bradley about a week later in Vegas uh because he was he was there for some of like other shit i don't know I, I well i guess he was probably in town for the same shit because it was the following weekend was uh alvarado rios too yes and so we were in vegas and i saw him in vegas and he was kind of walking he was like had glasses on and his hood up and so i could see like how he probably wouldn't get recognized by very many people but i stopped him just because i saw him and i was like oh hey tim and he stopped and but that dude had the most vacant look on his face bro like he looked i he looked terrible and he he was swollen he looked fucked up and i was just like i didn't talk to him for long cuz he seemed like almost almost like confused i was like wowza yeah. you know cuz he got fucked up man like he got fucked up real bad dude he got concussed badly most referees would have stopped that last round he was on he he was on pinwheel he had no idea what was going on yeah like him. couldn't keep his feet you know it was like yeah amazing that, that, that wow. was like, literally that was like the whole rocky that was the whole like rocky one ending when you had apollo creed just reeling over there and yeah rocky has the slugger coming in trying to finish him off and he's just flailing away trying to hold him off and at the end they just oh man it was an incredible incredible fight yeah, but that was tim bradley. and tim bradley was a warrior through and through and then you know the marquez fight the pacquiao finishing off and everything like yeah Mar um bradley is definitely i would say is probably gonna be a shoe in this year um I thought he would probably got an earlier as opposed to other years. But like we said, man, when you compare the names that he had to go against, it was really, really hard to break that pack because certain names are just, you, there's no way you're going to get past that. Hopkins, yeah. Lloyd, you know, even Andre Ward, for example. So, but a year like this, when it's thin, yeah, Brad was probably getting in. Yeah. And, and another name too, that I saw, I, and I agree. Like, I don't, I, I think you're pretty much spot on, dude. I think that, uh, for me, he's not the shoe in kind of name. Like, like you said, in the in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of stronger names, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. he's wasn't the shoe in kind of name on this ballad, but he's much closer on this ballad for sure. Um, another name, actually, another another fighter that I've seen a number of people vote for. Um, and I mean, I'm kind of interested because I mean, I I don't have a compelling argument against it per se it's just i didn't vote for him and that's carl frotch i yeah. mean i voted for him actually this year for the first time yeah i'm not against it like i said at all it's just i think that that's that's a discussion for sure oh totally totally um frotch is one of those guys man that uh, he he was an overachiever you know when he first came on the scene you saw his skill set and everything like that you thought that, okay, you know, he, he'd probably do well in the UK scene and maybe win a European title, but in terms of really breaking... It's not particularly fast. No, you know. You know doesn't you know, look super scary. skilled or anything. You yeah, know. he was really gorky and awkward. His first time we, when I saw him against Jermaine Taylor, 
And Taylor was no like finesse guy himself, man. And made for a weird clash of styles, but Taylor for the most part was out boxing. I mean, you would just after Frotch scored that dramatic knockout, even then I still had my reservations. I'm like, well, okay, that's what he did, but anybody that's worth a damn is gonna whoop his ass after yeah. that. But to his credit, man, you know, he had one of those awkward styles, but he made it work well for himself. He was scrappy as shit, wasn't afraid to get in there and fight. And was willing to fight anybody that there was out there. Like he didn't duck anybody. Went to the Super Six tournament, made a much better showing than I think anybody expected by making it to the finals, and um, actually excelled even more so after that fight. After his after his career peaked at the Super Six, like you would think, okay, his career peaked after he loses a, a competitive fight with Andre Ward. Even at that point, making it that far in that tournament when no one thought he would was you know pretty uh, remarkable in itself. But what makes him even more you know what makes him even more impressive is that after losing the ward, that's when he starts doing his best work. I would think, you know what I mean? In his career, which is his light career work. Um, immediately after losing the ward, his next fight, he fights Lucian Butte, who was on a tear um, in 30, and 0 at that point, Butte, Butte was not a part of the super six tournament. So to go back a little bit, um, that super six tournament, like yeah, they featured almost everybody in that division, except for Butte. So yeah, was, he was like the lone like holdout as far as the the belts went and shit. Exactly, and Butte was tearing asses up on HBO, right? Like he had the rematch with um Lebrado Andrade, knocked him out. Uh, I think he knocked out um, what's his name? Um, Edison Miranda. Yeah, Edison Miranda. That was that was a great knockout too. Edison Miranda's clowning him, and then he just fucking bang. <laughs> <laughs> And he just looked like a vicious ass dude. Like he was beating the shit out of guys, you know, and people were really clamoring. They're like, man, Butte should have been the super six. I bet you he would have won. Yada, yada, yada. Or he probably would have easily made the finals. And um, when he ended up fighting Frotch and Frotch is coming off of the lost award, most people I think thought Butte was going to win that fight. What'd you think? Yeah, I, actually I called a uh, Carl Frotch, but only because Butte was, I'm pretty sure, favored and should have been, but yes. there were uh, there was kind of whispers about whether or not he could take a shot, and that was the question: was that you know, because Lucian Butte had been hurt a, a couple of times before then, like mm -hmm. Lubrado Andrade hurt him real bad, you know, and I, uh, Andrade could punch. That was about the only thing he could do, but he could punch. I mean. But regardless, um, you know, there were, there, yeah, there were some whispers and I was kind of just like, ah, you know, if Frotch catches him, then I think that it could be it. But Butte was and should have been favored, I'm pretty sure. So it makes sense. But I remember that because that was massive, dude. That was massive. He caught him up against the ropes and Butte was just like, he had nothing. That was a beatdown. Frotch beat the shit out of him that fight. Yeah. Like, was, you know. That was really, really impressive because, like we said, Butte was undefeated, looked upon as, like, the dark horse of the division that after he gets through Frotch, he's probably going to fight for supremacy with what Andre wore. And that was, like, the fight people were, like, looking forward to. And Frotch, I, you know, threw a major monkey wrench in that. So for him winning that fight and then, you know, soon after he fights an easy defense against Yusuf Mack, but he has a rematch with Mikel Kessler. And... um their first fight, uh, Kessler won, you know, a close decision against him. And yeah, a lot of people thought Frotch could have took it, could have uh, taken it, and et cetera. Yeah. But it was still, you know, a fight that like Kessler was one of those guys that he already proved himself to be like a superior class of the most individuals, man. And in that era of super middleweight, which was very competitive, um, he fights Joel Kalzaki near the end of Kalzaki's career. Oh, well, not so much near the end of Kalzaki's career, but the end of Kalzaki's super middleweight. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, and in a fight that a lot of people, including myself, thought that Kessler would have a chance, well, you know, had a good chance of winning. Oh, yeah, he put on a clinic, started a little slow. Kessler had an incredible jab and was timing him and beating him up a little bit. But once Kalzaki started getting his rhythm in, you know, started doing the herky jerky and all that shit, like he just he, he did what he did. He just befuddled you out. Then it was just slap after slap all night long, yeah. motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and a guy like Kessler, who's not really quick of foot and needs to really, you know, keep himself settled to let his punches go, he 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 couldn't keep up with that. But no shame in that. Kalzaki did that to everybody. And Kessler was so competitive in that fight that he was still near, you know, that most people figured. Kind of like Rodrigo Valdez after losing to Carlos Monson, that okay, now that they're gone, he'll just overtake the division himself. 
And it really didn't happen, too, because when he joins the Super Six, you know, he was one of the main favorites to take the whole thing. And then he loses immediately to Andre Ward. And um, so, yeah, he even even after all that, because Ward ends up winning the Super Six and proves himself to be like, you know, a fucking uh, much better than anyone ever, ever anticipated. Um, Kessler is still looked upon to be the class of the division. And, and considering that he already beat Frotch beforehand, Frotch again still has to claim, you know, prove himself. And then, and probably even, like, even in a better, more um, uh, impressive performance than Butte because of the guy he was fighting ends up winning a really, really close, you know, a uh, really, really good decision. Like it was a hell of a fight. I worked that one too for punch zone. Yeah, dude, he was on a, he was on a really good tear, especially after losing to Andre Ward. And I mean, it's, it's crazy because a couple of those fighters that Andre Ward beat one wound up going on to having pretty respectable careers after proving that they unfortunately were not in his class, but no shame in that, no embarrassment. He was a very, very, very good fighter. But then, yeah, after the Mikkel Kessler win, you know, he, he avenges that win and then gets put in with a young George Groves, bro. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember I remember how controversial that first fight was and uh, the ending of the first fight because, you know, uh, Frotch was down, hurt pretty bad. And that was the thing was that Frotch could be caught. He could be hurt. He didn't have great defense. Like I said, he's he's not very fast didn't have very fast hands didn't have fast, very fast feet didn't move his head a ton you know it's like you start listing off all the shit about him as a fighter and it's like you're not you're not these aren't like championship attributes what are you talking about but it was his determination you know his determination and uh punching power too it definitely helped but his determination mostly i think the fact that he was just willing to walk you down all night and if he needed to he could he could do it in a punch or two and that was when you have that kind of confidence as a fighter, I think that that makes you a different kind of fighter, even if you have a lot of your other attributes are somewhat more ordinary or whatever. And so uh, that showed up against George Groves where he gets put down hurt. And it looks like, you know, that this might not go so well for him. And this might be the end of, you know, Carl Frotch, I think maybe has gone through it a little bit too much because there was talk of that. I remember people saying that at the time, like, dude, Carl Frotch has had one of the most difficult schedules uh, and, you know, he didn't win them all, but that's what happens when you have one of the most difficult schedules uh, just going from, from uh, where you talk, when, where you started shit, even going back to like Robin Reed, if you want to go ahead and like skip Ryback key there, but Jean Pascal, Jermaine Taylor, Andre Durrell, Kessler, Abraham, Glenn Johnson, Andre Ward, Lucian Boutte, Yusuf Mack, Mikkel Kessler, George Groves, George Groves. That's pretty fucking good in the modern era, you know? Doesn't get a whole lot better than that. But in any case, it, it looked like he was finished against George Groves the first time, and he winds up coming back and scoring a surprise stoppage that a lot of people felt was early. I get it. But mm -hmm. then he gave us 80,000 reasons to not to doubt him again in the rematch, right? Oh my God, man. What a knockout that was. And again, uh, that was a really brutal. close fight. Like Groves, God bless him, man. On any other night, he probably would have won a world title. Cause like he, again, he was clearly more skilled than Frotch. I think he was faster or everything like that. But, uh, you know, Frotch, like you said, the determination, the way he just keeps on walking you down. He had an underrated jab and, you know, on an underrated like fight acumen too, in terms of like he knew what he was doing and like you know that's um, true adjusting, adjusting things. And in the second fight, you can tell his adjustments were working in overtime as he was working there and like really, really putting the pressure on Groves. And Groves was like getting unnerved as the rounds were going on. And that right hand that he uncorked that absolutely flattened him, man. You couldn't picture anything better than that. You know, that was a beautiful shot. And Groves was out, just and that became like a sign of Groves' career. I mean. The guy had ended up becoming a world champion, but I don't think really ended up making the expectations that people hoped for him because every time he really had a big, big fight, um, he'd end up, you know, losing it or so. But yeah, that was huge, huge, huge. And, um, you know, at first, Frotch, it wasn't even like thought of that he was absolutely going to retire at that point. There was still other options for him. Um, Triple G was on an absolute tear at that point, And there were talks about Frotch potentially fighting him. Um, Frotch was definitely try was in the uh, in the sweepstakes of uh, trying to fight Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. back then as well because oh, yeah. I wanted that fight. Everybody wanted a, you know a piece of Chavez Jr. back then because he was the money guy, you know. And um, 
There was that fight was actually kind of close to being made, wasn't it? A couple of times. I think so. Yeah, and I wanted that fight. I was like, that should just be a banger. However, however it goes, it would have been totally. Chavez wasn't as useless as he you know currently is now, but um. Yeah, you give him the right style of opponent. This should be fun. Totally, but it just wasn't meant to be. And when Froch realized that his options were kind of limited, and I don't think he was that interested in fighting Triple G. At that point, yeah, I don't huh? think I just I think he was done with those kinds of fights. Like he was just like, I, you know, am am I really going to go in there and get chopped up? You know, even for a win, am I going to go in there and get chopped up? Nah. Which would have happened, man. I mean, I Froch is a hell of a fighter, but uh, Triple G in 2013, 14, I, yeah. Yeah, it probably would have been bad news for Froch at that yeah, point. He, you know? he would have been really competitive. He would have put on a hell of a fight, but he probably would have got beat down and stopped around round nine or round ten. But yeah. that being yeah. said, um, he retired after the Groves fight in 2014. Um, and I would say if you look, you know, top to bottom, that's a you know Hall of Fame worthy career. And, and in a year like this, like I said, man, I think he had, that's why I put a check mark next to him. And now I'm almost feeling bad that I didn't, dude, because I'm I'm even thinking about the the pre fight between him and George Groves in the rematch. Though so you want a little you know, push and a pull, yeah, yeah, a yeah, push yeah. about <laughs> damn because they gave us top notch comedy too. Probably should have voted for Frog, but I didn't. But no, you know what though? I mean, no, um, you have some worthy candidates yourselves. So it's, it's, like, like, like I said, there's that ballot except that between I picked Frog and you picked uh, Santos last year. Yep, and it and for me it was just uh, that was like I said earlier one of those names where it was like you know on other years he ain't getting in they ain't even any any even and he probably isn't this year either, but it's at the very least you know I wanted to give it a shot like try to try to push him in there if I could but well, no uh, I think that for a lot of those names that deserve that deserve votes whether they're gonna get it or not they deserve our vote. I vote for Gilbert, um, Gilberto Roman every year. I know you have um, since you've been voting. Yep. Uh, you know, another guy that people sometimes vote for, Sot Chitalata. Like, there's, there are certain names on there that deserve votes and at least the consideration of it, as opposed to just being like, oh, well, you know. Well, and, and you know, uh, somebody like, well, and, and people might be listening in or watching and going like, who the fuck are these names? You know, these guys are some hipster jerks. They're just naming some weird names and That's it, yeah. thinking that they're somebody, you know, looking at box rec, whatever that might be true, <laughs> but no, uh, look, dude, like it, it, a lot of the knowledge when it comes to boxing history and the greats and whatnot, you and I've talked about this a lot, both on shows and off shows. Mm -hmm. Um, the knowledge for when it comes to history and all time greats really only extends down to like lightweight ish, maybe featherweight, um, get down below that. And it's struggle time, even for a lot of historians, dude, even for a lot of historians, uh, it's not, it's not easy to kind of, I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. I talked about it earlier about a lot of these, uh, votes and whatnot in the ballots being very pro American, so is boxing, you know, overall, so is boxing. It's very pro-America, so are the ratings, so are, you know, the way the fighters that are written about in the ring, or, well, that used to be written about in the ring, um, you know, et cetera. But, like, you know, it's difficult to know a lot about, especially for uh, a group of foreign fighters in lower weight classes when you don't get to see them as often, you don't get to read about them as often, you don't know as much about them, et cetera. So, yeah, we do wind up having to do some research and having to go look around or the thing is though, it's like, you can't really claim ignorance at this point because most of these fucking fighters fights are on YouTube. Like you could just go watch them. So there's not really much excuse to be like, you know, you're calling people hipsters and like, Oh, you don't know. You could just go watch. They're there. You can go look at them yourself and you could see that Hilberto Roman was a very skilled fighter and a great fighter and one of the greatest fights. What's that? I said Roman was incredible. Yeah, Just well, beautiful technician, man. One of the one of the top few fighters in his in his weight class all time. Yes. I mean, if that's not in in Sochilada too, Santos Lasiar also. All of these fighters are in the top few fighters all time of their respective weight classes or their shared weight classes in this case. Um, so I mean, it doesn't for me. That's a fairly clear you know it's indicator just, that these you know these fighters should be getting in but they're you know we don't know as much about them or at least in general as voters we do but 
most it takes decades for some of these guys to get in man like it was they were lucky like they were lucky enough that um before things changed up that yoko kushikin was able to get in for instance um a while i was like, shocked when I, because that was my first year and when i found out he wasn't in i was like oh yeah really yeah. it's incredible um it took years for um uh the korean hawk um jung koo chang to get in you know, before he finally got his, uh, before he finally got inducted, around, and like, that's nuts. So. Yeah, these are dudes that are just sitting. Yeah, um, another one, uh, junior flyweight Myung Woo Ya, um, top guys in their divisions. You know what I mean? Just but the, from yeah, different parts top two or three fighters in their divisions type, mm-hmm. type of yeah. guys. You know, and you know the ones that do get in really quickly. A guy like uh, Chiquita Gonzalez, Michael Carbajal, um, Ricardo Lopez, Mark Johnson. That's because they've been featured on American television. Exactly. Featured in magazines. They've been talked about a exactly. lot. Exactly. Um, if a guy like Yuri Abakachev, who had the skills and probably, you know, his career was cut was a little cut short because of um injuries and other things, had he been featured on American television and um, you know, had a following over there and maybe, you know, held the title a little bit longer, he probably would have been in the Hall of Fame a long time ago. So that's how you that's how you look at these things, you know. Yeah, there's absolutely no question. With more exposure, a number of these fighters would have had far more, uh, you know, far more chance. And another, actually another name too, that I thought about voting for. So like, you know, my last two votes were kind of like, eh, you know, I I really was bounced around and wasn't sure. Mm-hmm. But a guy that I thought about voting for, Yvonne Calderon. Yes. And I thought that he's another one that might get some love this year, you know, because he's also got a very recognizable name. Uh, and he was on a lot of pay-per-views, a lot of American pay-per-views, and usually toward the toward the opening side with his strawweight ass. But no, you know, it that's how it goes. That's what I'm talking about. You know, no nobody wants to recognize these lower well, divisions. Calderon, man, for himself, he was the most dominant strawweight that anyone has seen since the days of Ricardo Lopez. The difference between them, like you just said, Pat, was that Lopez was knocking the shit out of these dudes, whereas Calderon was just going 12-round waltz every single time. And was it exciting to watch? Absolutely not. But you just knew you were watching a guy that, he was just a beautiful practitioner, you know. There have been dominant champions at Strawway beforehand, before um, Ivan Calderon, and he, you know, around Ricardo Lopez this time. Not even just Lopez. You had a guy like um, who's isolated on the ballot, Ratchachani uh, Sorvorpin, yep. who was a champion around the same time as Lopez. Sorvorpin was knocking the shit out of everybody in that division around that time too. But if you look at the guys he was fighting, it was just desultory. Like those, the you know the 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 amount of like really talented, really high quality world class fighters at one hundred and five pounds is next to nil. I mean, it's gotten a lot better over the years, but if we're talking about its infancy stages of the late 80s and early 90s, man. Eh. They were just putting anybody in there, dude. Seriously. Anybody. Whatever, yeah, you have a handful of pro fights, you might get a title fight, and you're just going to get waxed in two rounds, and no one ever heard you again. That's what was going on. So when Calderon came on, no one had seen someone that dominant that like really like proved themselves, um, like I would say, say like since lopez or even opposed to like maybe um who's the other guy there rosendo alvarez for example yeah. so yeah lopez nemesis yeah 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 but i mean calderon he he completely wiped out that division too anyone that was in there he you know he proved himself to be the completely dominant champion and that whole era there was there wasn't a guy there what made him even more impressive too is that at a small stature he was a small guy he was smaller than lopez yeah really, really tiny he ends up moving up to 108 and uh fighting the champion over there a fucking giant for the division uh hugo Cazares, correct yep and a guy with you know with no power ends up outboxing Cazares and becoming champion of that division too yeah, and, and it took, you know, somebody really strong and much bigger to like and and at the end of his career too. Uh yeah, I mean, you got to give Ivan Calderon some love. I understand if you don't really like his style. A lot of people didn't even at the time and don't now. Like, you know, it's one of those rare cases where like history has not really looked at him much kinder, I guess, cuz they just haven't really looked at him much at all. But yeah, I could see Ivan Calderon getting some love this year too. Absolutely without question. Um but yeah, 
I I don't disagree with a lot of that stuff. What's that? I didn't vote, I didn't vote for Calderon this year, but I mean, I have voted for him in past years. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, here's a question for you then. What about, here's another one, Michael Moore. Because he was another one that I've like pulled over and like looked over his name a few times. And this was a year that I was more inclined to maybe vote for him. I didn't, but I was more inclined to think about voting for him yeah. as I was to others. Yeah, and I and I think that for he'll probably get more votes than he normally would this year too. Um, on name recognition, heavyweight, you know, championship, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, but also, I, I mean, personally, I feel like his light heavy his light heavyweight run is a little bit overrated. Um, he didn't really have a super great light heavyweight run, but he was an exciting fighter, a very exciting fighter, and good punching power. <laughs> but but didn't beat a lot of great names there and didn't beat a lot of great names at heavyweight either. So, I mean, he's got basically the Holyfield win. And beyond that, it, it starts getting thin really quickly. When he became light heavyweight champion, um, he was WBO light heavyweight champ. And this is 1988, all right? As much as the WBO, no one gave a shit about them in the 90s. It was even worse in the late 80s when they first became an organization because this is a was one of their first champions you know what i mean so and i can't remember what it was but there was something weird about him in that belt too like the way he got it or said something about it i can't remember offhand but i just remember that his reign like there was something strange about it i mean for his credit like Mm. he beat the hell out of anyone that was you know that came that came up to him but like you said his his um his late heavyweight, um, his late heavyweight run was was really really thin. The best name on his record was Frankie Swindell, you know. So, or maybe Leslie Stewart. Excuse yeah, me. Leslie yeah, Stewart. Leslie Stewart. Yeah, and then and the light heavyweight version of Frankie Swindell. Yeah, exactly. Which was, you know, again, I love Frankie Swindell. He, he was, was a scrappy as a light heavyweight. He was actually Very pretty decent. Guy, and he was, he was a pretty good fighter too, man. I mean, as at light heavyweight, he was an actual contender. He fought Prince Charles yeah. Williams for the title. Um, you know, fought more. Yeah, he was actually a pretty yeah. good fighter, but then he moved yeah. up to heavyweight. He, he moved up to heavyweight and became a uh, fucking tree trunk because he was so short and just fat. <laughs> I mean, a pain in the ass to deal with, just not yeah. good though. Like you know, you can't you, you can't uh, forget those Friday night fights when you somehow <laughs> win the main event and you would see him just like shuffling his stomach around trying to deflect punches with <laughs> laying on the ropes and. <laughs> Look, but, you could see there was skill there, but there was just a lot of other stuff there too. But when Moore moved up to heavyweight, I mean, at first when he first came up, because he was really exciting as a light heavyweight, because, you know, as he said, he was really hungry. He was aggravated. He was pissed off. Um, he always had to starve himself. And he already had a mean streak to begin with. So he had no problem just going out there and ravaging whoever he could fight. But the main guys that he could have fought to solidify himself as the main light heavyweight, Virgil Hill, Prince Charles Williams, um, Bobby Chez, I guess. I don't know if he was that cruiserweight at that point or not, but like those are the names, potential names he could have fought. And he never fought any of them. Like I said, his biggest names were Leslie Stewart and Frankie Swindell. Plus no one gave a shit about the WBO title. But when he first moves up to heavyweight, I mean, he still had that exciting style at first, you know, and you think about the fights that he went through, um, the W like people forget too. He became WBO champion before he fought. He buried a Holyfield. No one considers the WBO title a real title because no one thinks of Tommy Morrison as a former WBF, as a former heavyweight champion. No one thinks of Ray Mercer as a former heavyweight champion. Those were both WBO champions. You know what I mean? No one thinks of Francisco Damiani as a former heavyweight champion. So that's yeah, where we're see, They'll go Mercer and Morrison, but then you say Damiani and they're like, well, okay, maybe no WO then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you, if you say that, you got to go with all of it, whatever. So, exactly. So, you know, in that case, Moore might be a three-time heavyweight champion because people do consider the WBO belt then. So he fights Burt Cooper in that, and one of the all-time great fights you would ever see, man, fucking heavyweight scraps. Him and Cooper trade knockdowns and hurt and everything like that, and, you know, Moore, um, Moore uh, wins the fight. But something changed in Moore after that one, too, man. That was, like, the fight that kind of, like, changed him a little bit. Like, a year before that fight, he fought um, Alex Stewart. That was another absolutely underrated scrap because Stewart was a guy that fought everybody back then. Huge punch. Couldn't take a punch, but could be dangerous unless he was fighting Mike Tyson. And he, him and Moore, man, those two scrapped the shit out of each other. It was a really, really good fight. Moore looked like he almost ripped his head off in the beginning. Stewart comes back because he's that's how he was. And they traded blows until Moore eventually stops him. But after the Cooper fight, 
like I said, man, his style kind of changed a little bit. Like after his game, his brain shook and rattled and having almost like a Foreman Lyle-esque type brawl. It was like, yeah, you know what? Do I really need to be doing dealing shit with shit like this? And things started changing with him, man. More, you know, started going the distance a little bit more. Like he was still winning fights. He was still dropping dudes. Um, but it wasn't quite the same as what we saw. And so when he beats Ivan to Holyfield, I mean, yeah, that was a huge win. And that was, you know, he came off the canvas and it was inspirational. And, you know, especially of Teddy Atlas freaking out and going through the theatrics of all that, like, you know, putting on a movie. And it's it's ridiculous. I got you know? your kid on the phone. He wants yeah, to talk yeah. to dad. Where's daddy? It's like, dude, shut up. Who was the referee for that fight? Oh, Hold man, on. I don't I'd have to look. But yeah, good no, God, dude. Was- might have been Mills Lane. It might have been. I don't know who was the referee, but like at one point he drags the poor referee over there. Look at us, man! I'm gonna tell him to stop a fight. And you see the referee looking like the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, like get off of me! <laughs> and then, you know, if you don't stop fighting right now, do you hear me? The referee's like, yeah, yeah, sure thing. Okay. Yeah, Mills is like, I'll throw you out of the ring like I did Hopkins. Get out of yeah, here. Like, get out of here, you twerp. But <laughs> regardless, you know it, especially because more to his credit, he did fight brilli- brilliantly. And after a slow start, came back and started, you know, putting things together. And memorably, at the end of the fight, you know, he has his hands up like that. And he's going, like, nodding the nodding the holy field and stuff. Like, yeah, that was a big win. But after he gets knocked out by George Foreman, that's when his career really just unraveled. Sure, he became champion again, but he never got the Foreman rematch. Let's check. Yeah, I know he coveted. And, you know, he just kind of became like that. He never was known as that guy out of the division. Even after beating Holyfield the first time, it was still kind of like that transition. It never where... seemed like it was going to last. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. He, he never seemed like he was going to be like a long reigning champion. And, and like, that's okay. I like, thought Foreman was going to be the guy to stop him. But, you know, that just that ended up happening. That ended up becoming like what he's most known for. It happened. It happened. And, yeah, sure, he had a very successful post right after that. You know what I mean? He became champ again. and um, But it's just nothing really ever peaked for him. You know, in his biggest fight after that, he fought Evander Holyfield in the rematch. He Admirably, he fought well, you know, getting off the canvas a million times. But he got his fucking thrashed in that fight. Yeah. And then, you know, his biggest fight after that was David Tua, and he got knocked out in like 12 seconds. So, Man, that was so weird too. Like that's such a weird knockout because it's like it's not like he doesn't get punched hard, but he gets punched and it's like he's conscious the whole time, but not conscious. He's like <laughs> awake, but like uh, you know, like fucking falling just, back. Like you just it was almost like <laughs> when you watch it, it's like someone trying to like hold off a, like someone going in front of an 18 wheeler. And just putting their hand out there and thinking I'm gonna stop it like that because you see Tua come out and he's like right away and Moore is just throwing out jabs like try but he's backing up the whole time he's just jabbing jabbing yeah. jabbing trying to keep him off him like there's gonna do anything and it's not and pretty soon within like two seconds he's in the corner now because like the jabs ain't gonna do shit to them right and that's when Tua just goes pop pop and like you said hits him with the right hand on the forehead like the temple area in the hook and you see Moore just gone just, yeah it was know. like the it was like he just turned the lights out like yeah, yeah. and he just like and leans he just, back and he's leaning back like a slinky and if you watch closely you see one of Moore's corner men in the corner over there right and you see him go damn it like just snap his hands he's like fuck because <laughs> he I just knew it fuck i knew it and he just looks so disappointed he just seemed he's like Oh, man, Dude, do, you, do you remember i'd have to look but i'm not gonna bring his boxer cup right now but it, it would have been like a fight or two before then and michael moore was on espn he fought on espn and fucking Actually, teddy, I mean, box right up so so fucking teddy atlas uh goes up and he's interviewing him afterwards and he's like you know michael i don't think you should fight anymore you know i don't think you should fight anymore right you're gonna retire right and michael moore is looking at him like I just beat this guy. What are you talking about? And Teddy Atlas is like, yeah, you, you're going to have to tell me. You promised to me. You're not going to fight anymore, right? You, he's going to retire. He's going to retire. He's, he's going to tell him he's going to retire. And he, Michael Moore is just like, yeah, okay, okay Teddy. <laughs> like, it was it was a super fucking awkward interview with Teddy trying to, like, shame Moore. Like, you know, you, you know you didn't look good. You know, you didn't look very good, right? And it was like... <laughs> Bro, my ex girlfriend fucking criticizing me right to my new girlfriend or something. It was fucking, it was awkward as fuck, dude. Anyway, I remember that shit. It was on, you know, Friday Night Frights or Tuesday Night Frights or some well, shit like that. Well, um, 
more is two fights after he got after he lost the the Holyfield fight in the rematch. More went through like you know legal issues and some other stuff outside of the ring troubles or whatever. He disappeared for a few years. He resurfaced he resurfaces again in the early two thousands, and his fight on ESPN that you're referring to it might have must might have been the one was against Terrence Lewis. It was a probably was him and Lewis probably. was always one of my favorites back then a perennial guy that was never going to become champion uh Philadelphia slugger yeah but they'd throw him in with anybody throw him in with anybody slow as absolute hell um had fucking silly putty for a chin but the dude could bang like he had a monster punch so that's what he had going for him and I think he actually wobbled more at some point before he inevitably got stopped so that would make sense but um yeah, that was just a name I thought again. That's like another one that you like it's on the radar that you could think about. Well, you know, maybe this year he could slip in. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I mean, he wouldn't really be on on mine personally, but I wouldn't be surprised. Like, and I could I could see it happening. And I wouldn't be shocked. Here's but a yeah. new here's a new name that got brought up. Uh who what the fuck was that? Started making a resurgence um recently since he's been released from jail, Michael Nunn. You know, uh, that was that was one guy I voted for, actually. Um, okay. And but again, you know, <laughs> I almost feel stupid because it's like some of the votes that I gave. It's like I don't I don't feel as though I'm going to justify them by you know forever and ever you know super hardcore or anything. But again, that's the nature of this ballot, dude. I think that oh. it was kind of an opportunity where I don't think that Michael Nunn's going to get in personally, but. Uh, I, that's also not really dictating how I'm going to vote. Like I'm not, I'm not going, ah, I'm not going to vote for somebody I believe is deserving just because ultimately they're not going to get in. So what's the point Fuck it. for me? That's not how it goes for me. It's whoever I think deserves it, you know, among, on this ballot should be who I vote for. And hopefully others are voting the same, but um, yeah, Michael Nunn is definitely someone who I think his run at middleweight is probably a little bit underrated and is run at super middleweight too, for that minute, for that matter. Um, the, the super middleweight division, even that he competed in was pretty damn good. So, yeah. you know, it's uh, yeah, he's, he's one of those guys that I think is definitely has a better resume than I think is, than it might look like at first glance. Well, when he first, I mean, he, he Michael Nunn was one of those guys that like, he almost made the 84 Olympic team. And he was a standout amateur back then. But when he turned pro, um, working uh, with the Duvas more or less and stuff like that, he um, he he was on a tear. Like by the time he ended up fighting in the late night uh, nineteen eighty eight, he ends up fighting Frank Tate, who he lost to I believe in the trials, um, who was undefeated, who was an undefeated uh, IBF champion himself. This is at this point now. This is post Marvin Hagler. Hagler had dominated. And ruled the division from 1980 up until his controversial loss to Sugar Ray Leonard in 1987. And after Leonard um, beat Hagler, obviously Leonard retired. You remember, you know, he famously said, um, I didn't want the belts. I just wanted to beat him. I'm retired again. I'm out. So the middleweight division was kind of in a tailspin again. You know what I mean? Tommy Hearns won a vacant title. But then he he soon off was doing his own thing. Um, I, he loses to Iran Barkley. Iran Barkley ends up losing to some blue cow, you know, um, excuse me, Iran Barkley ends up losing to Roberto Duran soon enough. And then that goes on to its own thing. Um, the IBF, they're going, what, what's going on with them is that um, you have, their title became vacant. And then um, Frank Taint, Taint, <laughs> Frank Tate fights for a vacant title against at that point. Um, the very, I mean, very- that was kind of true, but yeah. <laughs> Frank Tate, um, the uh, 84 Olympian, um, ends up fighting Michael Olajide for the vacant title. Michael Olajide at that point, you know, one of the one of those guys that was like the, the epitome of the 80s. Me and Corey love Olajide, you know what I mean? Guy was like a Michael Jackson look like he had the whole soul glow Jerry Curl hair going on. Uh, <laughs> just the day he glow always glow. had like a members only jacket on. Yeah, or some man, shit. he was cool as shit. Like you know the the aviators, the sequin jackets, the the whole thing. Like there was that famous Ring magazine cover when he looked like just a, a pop star. He was a really cool guy, and plus he would knock the shit out of anybody. He was a really really good fighter. He was a guy that people wanted to see get whooped, but because he was a pretty boy and everything like that, but he could back it up in the ring. Most memorably. He knocked out um, a contender named Don Lee, just ravaged him. 
you know, but so when he fought Frank Tate, even though Tate, you know, with the pedigree of being a former Olympian, I think gold medalist and, um, you know, the whole nine yards with him, Elijah Day was still, because he was more popular, was the favorite, and Tate beat the shit out of that fight. It was, you know, really just a one-sided whooping. And then Tate uh, knocks out, I believe, Tony Simpson, and then, you know, goes into the fight with Michael Nunn, both undefeated. This would be a big, big fight today if this happened on during the Twitter age, I'm sure, because both guys undefeated all that. And if it happened on Showtime, everyone would be all over it. Anyways, none came of age in that fight, man. He dominated from start to finish and put on a beautiful display that no one really expected from because he hadn't really shown himself to, like, at that point. Like, everybody knew he was talented, but he really took himself to the next level in that fight. And that's, Pat, what you mean by that middle rate run where you were just like, damn, it was really, really, really impressive. Because soon after that, he fights uh, Juan Domingo Roldan. Um, Roldan was past that at this point, you know what I mean? Hearns had knocked him out, Hagler. He'd been around the bush a little bit, but... He was still a tough as nails guy, still a guy who had a credit incredible record. And if you were gonna beat him, like, you know, you're gonna have to go through the ringer. And same thing, man. None proved his class. Just outboxed him, outsped him. Uh the fights on YouTube where you can watch highlights, but Roldan took a whooping until he was stopped. But the fight that really, really solidified none that everybody thought was gonna be the future of boxing, the future of the nineties. He was the one that was going to catapult boxing into a new era and like kind of leave guys like Sugar Ray Leonard Hearns and the rest of them in the dust was his very next fight against Sumbu Kalambe. And Sumbu Kalambe, oh man, you know, what What else can be said about this guy? That like, if you listen to the show, you probably know about him, but one of the best technicians and one of the most underrated fighters you can imagine back in the day, man. This dude was beautiful to watch, you know, just a supreme boxer really really tough style to navigate and he had the wins he he had some really really good wins at that point i mean he whooped um mike mccallum undefeated mccallum at that point um in defense of his title he beat iran barkley uh for the vacant belt you know and made a number of defenses and just one of those guys that even though he didn't fight in america because he was based in italy um he was known by hardcore as one of the best fighters in the world so by the time those two get up fighting in 1989 like that was the fight that people were like, "Wow, man, this is gonna like prove some proof." Hmm? He took a took an undefeated Harold Graham's O for the yeah. European middleweight championship too. He beat a lot of guys, man. I think the undefeated only undefeated fight or uh, underrated fighter, if you ask me. Very underrated. The only guys I believe, I'm not looking at his record, the ones that was able to beat him was um, Dwayne Thomas, right? Um, I want to say yep, and, Dwayne uh, Thomas, Ayub Kalule. Ayub Kalule, yep, another underrated guy. And so, so yeah, man. Yeah, Some... Leonard Leonard trashed him, and so you know everybody was like, "Oh, he ate shit." But it's like, no, he's good. It was just that Leonard was really good. Yeah, yeah. So, but by the time Callum Bay fights Michael Nunn, um, it was supposed to be a unification fight as well. I think you know Callum Bay with the WBA and Nunn, you know IBF, and of course boxing being boxing, we don't want unification fights. And so the WBA strips Callum Bay because he had the audacity to fight none of you know another yeah. like god forbid something like that ever happens right the fucking stupid yeah so, probably literally only did it because he wasn't a star but you know that's how it goes probably so anyways i mean real ones knew this was like the fight of uh, this was the fight for supremacy all right and what most people expected to be a very tactical battle because Callum Bay was a, a safety first boxer so was none for the most part even though you know he scored a couple of knockouts um yeah, definitely Everybody, like a boxer puncher, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, Pat, and you know this as well. Nobody expected what the fuck happened. Why don't you explain what happened? <laughs> One of the loudest knockouts you will ever hear in your life. Like, I mean, it it sucks too because some of the versions that you, I think I fixed one. There should be a version that's fixed somewhere on on social media because the aspect ratio is all fucked up and all stretched. You know, on most of the versions, but I fixed one. In any case. It's just a one punch left hand knockout that's just like, ooh, holy shit. And it's so loud. And dude just is out. And it's like, wowza. You know, it's it I obviously, you know, I'm I'm not old enough to have, you know, witnessed it live and whatnot, but I would imagine I would have been like, holy shit, especially because it didn't really get going. Like nothing, it didn't get going yet. And nobody, I guarantee you, every because you know how there's so much sports betting now and you can predict when a fight's going to end and all that. I guarantee you not a single 
solitary person on the planet predicted a first round one punch knockout for Michael Nunn. Yeah, the odds were probably so long on that. Yeah. Because that's that's not what was that's not what happens with these guys. That's not how they fought. Yeah, you neither know? of them are like bombers or so. No, yeah, it doesn't make safe sense. Money was on that fight going the distance. Your safe money was on that going the distance. Whether none would want a competitive decision or Callum Bay or whatever, your safe money would be them two at least going the twelve round, and it probably wasn't going to be that exciting. And instead, none came out there very aggressive, just pumping his jab right away, keeping Callum Bay kind of off. Callum Bay was smaller than none. None was really tall and lanky, so. Just boom, 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 working, working, working. And Callum Bay, you can tell, was like trying to adjust, but he was struggling a little bit also with the reach and the length. So he was trying to like figure out a way to get in. But at one point, when he tried to reach in, that's when Nunn walked in himself. Like you said, Pat, just bah! with that one. Just, and it was so just like close, like knit, when he just boom, hits him and he just smooth. And brutal, dude. Yeah. Brutal knockout. And you know what happened afterwards too is that uh side a side note, um Sugar Ray Leonard, Mr. Ego, was actually frazzled by what he witnessed there. You know, what I mean he didn't say it on the broadcast, he was giving none his props and all that, but the story goes that after the fight, none um none frazzled Leonard so much by what he witnessed that Leonard went up to none, excuse me, at a nightclub or wherever, somewhere after the fight, and they went up to them and and um told none right there i'm gonna fuck you up one day you hear me is i'm gonna beat your ass i'm gonna fuck you up like over and over he was pointing at none he's like i'm gonna fuck you up you got that <laughs> like because he was already trying to play mind games thinking to himself okay i gotta fight this guy now and so he was already telling you know trying to like to... and at that point too it's probably for the best that leonard did it because none probably would have whooped him if had they fought yeah at that point i don't think it would have ended very well for ray leonard but you know yeah he you got to try to get some edge i get it it's got to retire on him three times and fucking <laughs> try to get some ended up, on him. You know, what was shocking is that ended up being Nunn's peak, you know, that fight. Like, what well, ended up people thinking, okay, now he's going to be the fighter of the of the 90s and yada, yada. He had such a desolatory fight with Iran Barkley, his very next fight, that he, first off, he looked petrified in it. Like, you don't know what was wrong or anything, but he just, he put on a real stinker to the point where most people thought Barkley even had a good chance of winning it because, like, Nunn just shit the bed in it. And soon after he fights Marlon Starling, who was a welterweight, not even yeah, a junior. he was not even a middleweight at all. Yeah, and he goes the distance again and doesn't look good in that fight either. An absolute stinker of a fight. Yeah, it was like Jermaine Taylor going the distance with Spanks or something like that, and yeah. then not looking yeah. good, you know? Totally, totally. And you're just kind of like, well, all right, what, what's going on here? Is this guy the real deal or is something going on? I mean, we've soon found out he was having outside the ring issues and dabbling and other stuff like that, but like, you know, it was starting to show up in the ring. It was so bad. Those two fights were so bad that Bob Arum, who was trying to make none into a superstar, shipped him out of America and was like, yo, I can't even deal with this one. Just send him to France to fight Donald Curry. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another non-middleweight, you know? Totally. So by the time he fights James Tony in 1991, none has stagnated a lot. Is he still considered one of the best in the world? Yes. But is the hype around him that people are thinking to be the future of boxing? That's long gone. So after he gets splattered by Tony in a fight that he's clearly winning. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, but you know, which a lot of that has to do with, you know, just James style and the way that he's like, you know, it's like, you got to kind of make him work. You know what yeah. I mean? And like, he's not, he does not the kind of fighter who wants to follow somebody around. And that's what he had to do. Totally. And his career never recovered from that. His career never recovered from that. He did become super middleweight champion. Um, a little bit of an underrated like reign over there too. Like he he beat Victor Cordoba, who was a good fighter, and then um a few other guys before he ended up losing a huge, huge upset to uh the unheralded Steve Little. But you know, if you look at his body at work, and then if you realize what he did at light heavyweight as well before he went to jail for for all those years for drug uh for drug offenses, um he was actually in line to fight um Roy Jones at one point, you know. And here's the thing too, Pat, and like other people say it too, you know, when he was aligned to fight Roy Jones was around 1999, 98, 99, 2000. So he fought Graziano Rochigiani for the WBC Light Heavyweight Championship for the vacant title. That's, that's a whole mess in itself. And um, loses a close decision in that. WBC decides not to not to recognize Rochigiani, strips him, gives the belt back to Jones. Rochigiani sues the WBC, is about to make them fucking 
bankrupt and then i don't know it's a whole it's a whole story but yeah they declared bankruptcy to get out of it that's what happened they declared bankruptcy and so they didn't wind up having to pay but a couple of fights later um a past and none fights william guthrie who was a former freshly former deposited late heavyweight champion you know and a guy that was still one of the top guys in the division and none thrashed him in one of his best performances in years like really whooped his ass knocked him down multiple times and you know stopped him viciously and at that point, when he did that to him, he was in line to fight Roy again. I think he was like mandatory challenger. And if you talk to people around back then, Roy was not keen to fight in Michael Nunn. Like if he didn't have to fight him, he wasn't going to try to fight him. Would Roy have been favored to win the fight? Yes. Would Roy probably have won the fight? Probably. Would Nunn have made him look really bad? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, and, well, and that's the kind of fighter that, you know, uh, in hindsight, we didn't. We never really got to see Roy against a whole lot of punchers, but none wasn't a big puncher. It was more that he was just a. Uh, he was first of all a southpaw, and second yeah. of all just a pain in the ass. Like he wasn't an easy fighter to fight, even for the ones, even for uh, the fighters who beat him. He was not an easy fighter. You know, he was like a. You had to work for it. You had to follow him around. You had to kind of like work up the timing, etc. And so, yeah, I think that for a guy like Roy who really depended on that kind of timing and explosive you know, whatever offense that'd have been tough for him. Totally. Totally. And yeah, I mean, like, as opposed to like finding a guy, like one of those other cupcakes that he was going around back then in the late night, well, like a guy like none, none would have gave him fists. You know, I think Roy would have eventually figured him out or whatever, but it wouldn't have been pretty at all. And Roy knew that. And so he was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I can go Avenue my way and navigate around here and there. No one's going to say anything. Oh, where's, Oh, there's Ricky Frazier. I'll fight him. Like, <laughs> Frazier, poor Ricky Frazier. It's a punchline for for years, unfortunately. Yeah, I would love to know how he went. You know, uh, the day after getting whooped up by Roy when he went back to the office at the NYPD, if people were just clowning him for that. <laughs> What's up, knockout? Yeah, sure. But I, I voted for none too. I mean, we talked about it a bit, but like, if you look at his body of work and everything, um, none is one of those guys. Like we said, he just came back into the limelight recently, but he's been forgotten because of going to jail for over 20 something years for offenses that did not warrant that much of a sentence. Um, no, and, and actually one of the, uh, one of the guys who handled his career and trained him for a while too, uh, you know, um, pops, Arthur, John Arthur, he actually passed away not too, too long ago. And I did a long interview with him when I was doing the, uh, Hannibal boxing podcast for a bit. That I, I mean, not because I did it, but just because of some of the stories that he told were so fucking wild that, like, I believe it's worth listening to for that alone. Literally, you'll listen to a few of the stories and go, what? Dude was like an underground death fighter. Death yeah. match fighter. I mean, I'm not kidding. At least that's what he said. So anyway, that was one of the guys who handled Michael Nunn uh, for a large chunk of his career before he had gotten into trouble um but yeah dude obviously getting into trouble he, he got uh sent away for years and years for like conspiracy to distribute cocaine i want to say it was it was yes, like it, it was, was like something stupid too like something like got caught doing like hemp doing something real dumb or something like that but yeah um and that obviously put a massive halt on his career and i know that initially when he had got gotten out there was some brief thankfully very brief talk about him coming back well, he had that really weird fight with um Pat something. What was that? that MMA guy? The guy that used to be in UFC. Rose oh. Namadi, what was his like boyfriend or something? Oh, Pat Curran or or Pat. um Yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know his last name. Pat something though. But it was like it was like the kickboxing match. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thankfully, it didn't get any any farther than. But I mean, dude, it's it's just been. Oh man, yeah, he didn't deserve to be away for as long as he was. Obviously, oh, but clearly, his career was was winding down before much of that stuff happened. Um, but yeah, as far as his Hall of Fame aspirations and whether or not he he deserves to be in there, I voted for him. So I thought that he, you know, at least especially at middleweight, had a very underrated career. Close as did I. Yep. Let's see who else was on there. Oh, actually, I was going to ask you, dude. So, what do you think about like the idea of you, 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 and I talked about this before, but like, um, and I've I know Cliff Rold has been somebody who's mentioned this, um, 
the idea of putting in like a Rafael Marquez and Israel Vasquez together or a Chris Eubank or Mike and, uh, you know, Nigel well, Ben. It's happened before. I mean, that's how it's kind of like, that's when you think about it, that's how um, Chiquita Gonzalez and, um, and Michael Carmichael, they went in together. So yeah, I know, I know a lot of people, I know Doug Fisher has mentioned that like if he's voted for Nigel Ben, he has to vote for Chris Eubank as well. Like some people, you just feel like they just, they need. Yeah. To and I'm not clowning it. I'm just, yeah, I'm curious. But when it comes to Vasquez and Marquez, yes, they had one of the biggest um, rivalries in boxing history. Uh, I I still call it a trilogy. I don't want to cons- I don't consider that fourth fight anything. Um, nor should nor should anyone, right? That was just an absolute farce. But when you compare their records, I just think that Marquez slightly comes out ahead, like head to head. And I mean, Vasquez has an incredible body at work himself, man. Not even just the the Marquez fights. One of my all time favorite fights is Vasquez against Johnny Gonzalez. That doesn't that rarely gets talked about today, you know. Or his fights with uh, Oscar Larios. Yep, he had a trilogy with Oscar Larios too, which it was fucking really good trilogy. Exactly, and you know, a host of his other fights that he went through um, before then. Like Vasquez was an absolute warrior, man. Just a vicious, really, really good fighter, and one that I enjoyed. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed watching but Marquez even before that man you know like when he when he became champion at Panaway and first he uh he ended the reign of Tim Austin Tim Austin very very underrated kid Mm -hmm. underrated champion that was looked upon to be almost unbeatable at you know at, at Bantamway for a number of years he wasn't the most active guy but I mean when he was active he was whooping everyone that he fought former Olympian and all that and um even before that fight Marquez was the one, the first person to, uh, to legitimately beat Mark Johnson. You know, um, sure, Johnson was a little bit of a step past it, uh, out of jail and stuff like that. But Marquez first beat him by split decision in a non-televised fight. And then when they had that rematch on HBO, knocked him out, you know. And then from there, like I said, he knocked Tim Austin clear out of the ring in a fight that he was actually hurting and on the verge of being stopped himself before he stopped him. And then he went on that tear of Bantam White himself. You know, he beat guys like Silence Mabuza twice and um, a host of other guys. And this was all before market. And this was all before uh, the Vasquez fight. Yeah, he he have obviously was one of the hardest hitting fighters in boxing at Bantamweight during his run. No question. He had a couple of just gnarly knockouts or massive, you know, or just, you know, beating dudes down type of, type of knockouts. Um, and, you know, heavy hands, not quite as skilled as his brother, not quite the natural counterpuncher that his brother is. But, um, yeah, just uh, absolutely no question. I think that his – what's that? I said those were all tough guys that he was, like, stopping too. I mean, I'm looking at his record now, Mauricio Pastrana, mm-hmm. uh, former champion. Heriberto Ruiz, top contender. Yeah, there were a number of fighters that he was just like smashing. And uh yeah, I think that his resume is pretty clearly uh ahead of Israel Vasquez. Man, and you know it sucks too cuz it's almost like how does that even work? You know, cuz Israel Vasquez beats him twice in you know, the you, you don't even count the fourth fight, I wouldn't either. And he beats him twice. But dude looks absolutely rough now. Um, I, I saw some photos of him from last weekend because a dude that I know, Chris Smith, he's the guy that wrote the book about Eder Joffre. Yes. And he lately has been doing a number of, uh, kind of, uh, fundraisers, I suppose, uh, for fighters who are still around and trying to get them to travel places to meet the fighters that they fought in yesteryear and stuff like that, you know, really cool stuff, to be honest. Um, and he has been hanging out with Israel Vasquez a little bit lately. And I saw photos of him from last weekend and man, he's, he looks gaunt. He looks bad. I mean, and I, yeah, uh, I think he almost lost one of his eyes a few years ago and, and now I'm not sure how much function it still has, but I think he still has it. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not sure it could be like a fake eye. I'm not trying to like, you know, zero in on the dude's eyes, but he doesn't look super great. And he gave up a lot of himself for especially that trilogy, but his career overall. Oh, um, so it's it's just crazy how that works because Rafael Marquez, on the other hand, looks fucking awesome. He looks like he he looks like exact same how he looks like, you know, fifteen years ago. It's amazing. 
So uh, I don't know how that all works. You know, I guess nobody really does. Jake LaMotta, you know, lived to be fucking 900 years old. And <laughs> I don't know. Dude and he was, was sharp the airport. entire time. Dude was still sitting there drinking whiskey and smoking cigarettes at Graziano's, man, up until the end. What a psycho. I don't know how it works. But yeah. Um, That's a good question, Pat. I would say, honestly, like, I think Ben and Eubank, I would be more, I would obviously vote. Like both they're of them. probably a little closer in terms if of resume. Look at, yeah, look at their resumes. Yeah, they both yeah. fought a lot of the same guys. I mean, a couple of differences here and there, but they were some of the same era. They had the same type of competition, very similar outcomes, and everything Wait like a that. Second, so, I just I'm sorry, but is Steve Collins in? No, no, he's not even on the ballot. <laughs> wow. Oh. <laughs> Why you thought Collins was in? I I don't know why I that was just kind of it just never really occurred to me until right now because I was like you were saying oh they fought a lot of the same guys and I was like wait a wait a fucking second where the fuck is Collins? Yeah, Damn. Collins is not even on the ballot. I That's mean maybe kind of fucked up actually. Collins maybe I don't know if he there's other guys I would put on the ballot first before Steve Collins I would say so. That's funny. And Collins was a hell of a fighter. I mean like had he. Had he, I mean, yeah, he one, didn't have a whole lot of longevity, is the problem. No, as champion, when he finally, like, you know, when he beat Eubank and started going on his run, he was, you know, he, he beat Eubank and then he beat him in a rematch. He beat Ben twice and um, he scored a couple of other. Um, uh, well, and, and I think that's why it sounds funny is that you're going to have a tough time justifying that to like the average person. They're going to be like, what? He beat both of these guys, but they're what? How, who? You know, yeah, so, totally. And then it looked like he was going to fight Roy Jones, and instead he retired. Well, I know he retired. He said there was some kind of something, some abnormal, abnormally, uh, abnormally with his like his brain or something like that. But yeah, you know, if Collins had lasted a little bit longer, he probably had a better chance of like at least making the ballot or something. But Eubank and Ben, their resumes are very, very similar. They fought, like I said, most of the same guys they fought, with the exception of a couple of them. And um, it's just too bad that like. You know, the American guys that they could have fought, like Roy Jones or James Tony, just it just never happened. You know, Ben ended up fighting uh, Gerald McClellan, and obviously that became like, you know, the biggest fight of his career for a number of reasons. And um, Eubank, who always just had like that asterisk of him just being like an arrogant idiot and like some other stuff going on with him, but no one really knew his heart after he lost his championship to Steve Collins. You know, what he accomplished moving up to cruiserweight and going through hell and back with Johnny um uh fuck the the Nelson. Johnny Nelson not Johnny Nelson, excuse me. No, no Carl, Carl, Carl Thompson. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Carl Thompson. I was like yeah, Carl Nelson. Thompson. Yeah, Carl Thompson. The cat both, both of those fights were absolute wars, and Eubank was not even a huge middleweight, super middleweight to begin with, moving up to cruiserweight to fight Thompson, who was a beast. And dropping him, hurting him, wobbling him, and going the hell and back before both of his eyes became like, you know, puffed up like oranges, looking like Andre Bardo and shit. And like, I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things that like I think I think most people agree with us that like you can't just put one in without the other. I think you can do that more so with Vasquez and Marquez and a couple of other instances of other guys, but when it comes to those two, nah, they just gotta go in together. And what do you and what do you think about like and I mean I guess we've talked about this too on like an other ballot uh you know like episodes or whatever but like a Chris John and I know that you didn't vote for him and I know that I'm not saying you're like a the massive Chris John advocate or something but there is an argument right there is an argument for his longevity I I'm not buying the argument yeah. <laughs> I think it's definitely a Sven Otke esque var- argument where there are a lot of really questionable uh, decisions or outcomes, or there's the, the, you know, you never, you never unified, you know, you never stepped out of your kind of zone here type of thing. And also on top of that, there's the dubious nature of a few of the earlier fights as well. So it's like, you know, what, what do you think about those kinds of, those kinds of entries on here? I mean, look, it's, Guys like that, Chris John, he gets on the bat, like you said, it's because of his longevity and how many wins he had and kind of like this Van Aki-esque um, nature of his of his reign. You know, a guy that, that's had so many defenses and had that type of longevity, you got to at least at least look at it and, like, you know, keep it, keep it in the sky, uh, take it into consideration. 
But then if you look at his actual record and see, you know, the type of competition that you fought, I mean, yeah, it is thin with the exception of a few names. And then those names, when you see them too, there's, you know, question marks to it. But there are some good wins for John. Besides them, I'm, obviously, I'm talking about the Juan Manuel Marquez fight. That's the biggest, you know, everyone's just like, what the fuck? All, all kinds of crap, right? You know what I mean? But, um, you know, if you look at it also, too, like Osamu Satu was a former champion. Oscar Leon was a was a top contender who gave everybody hell around that time. Um, Derek Gaynor, clearly, you know, former uh, former champion, Roy Jones protege. So these are na- well-known names that, you know, John was putting on his re- uh, putting on his record as opposed to like a guy like Wang Jongkam, who was just putting, you know, yeah, whomever. Yeah. whoever yeah like all those ring updates that you would see of him beating guys that are like eight and two ten and one this and that and just you know knocking silly every other week right but the the marquez fight too man you know when that first happened it wasn't like there was readily available tape of it so it was all kind of like hearsay from a lot of people the fight happened in 2006 you know what i mean it was more still tape there was no youtube back then or if it was youtube was in its absolute infancy um i remember when the fight was finally available like a few weeks later and we were just like all right let's watch this shit yeah, I yeah remember because that. there was so much question people were saying it was the worst robbery and anyone has seen in boxing history um others were saying no john comprehensively won there was just so much question and congestion that everyone's just like we need to fucking watch it to see what actually happened it's, it's been okay. forever since i watched it actually i remember at the time thinking that that marquez just started way too slow but it was mm-hmm. but it's been forever since i watched it Regardless of who you think won or lost, it still goes down in history. And Marquez went and made one of the biggest bonehead moves in history. Um, not taking, what was it, a Pacquiao fight or whatever money he was offered for a big fight. And then going to Indonesia, John's hometown, for fucking absolutely nothing. Yeah. Like peanuts. To, he to was, <laughs> yeah, he was offered like, it was like almost a million dollars or something like that, which... At the time, it was like, you know, Pacquiao hadn't exploded yet, you know, it, to that degree. And Marquez was not going to get that money anywhere else whatsoever. And then he went over instead. Nacho Beristain was like, fuck that. We're going to Indonesia and got paid. I think it was 30 grand for that <laughs> shit. So went to Indonesia, got paid 30 grand and lost his fucking belt. And then had to wait another whatever it was, two years to fight Pacquiao again. <laughs> bone yes. fucking head move bro no you, you can't make this shit up <laughs> but that's what happens when you drink your own pee right <laughs> <laughs> oh jesus bro I yeah i mean when john finally got exposed to america on on american um on american television again he was more so a mystery that like one of those guys that you can put back if you go back in like the early days of boxing after dark you know what I mean? When Daniel Zaragoza, who, who, I mean, he's not in that same field because he was featured a lot on television, but like, say like a young fan like me, I was hyped to finally see him get put on HBO or Philip Holiday. That's a better example because I was reading a lot about Holiday. He's based in South Africa. Yeah. He wasn't playing at America. All of a sudden now he's going to fight on HBO against Ivan Robinson. And I'm just like, oh shit, this is cool. So, you know, to know that, um, a guy like Chris John, who's been featured never in America, all of his fights have been in Indonesia or wherever, and the controversy with the Marquez fight, and now he's going to fight Rocky Juarez on HBO. I'm like, oh shit, I'm hyped. Like, you know, we're going to see if this is the real deal. Juarez is a bad motherfucker who's, you know, gave Barrera life and death a former Olympian. And we're going to see, um, you know, I'm, I can see from my own eyes now, is this guy like a, a punk or is he like, not a punk, I mean, um, a fake. Or is he the real deal? And, and close fight, you know, Juarez, again, always a bridesmaid, never a bride, came really, really close to winning that fight. Oh, you know, left hook, everything like that. But John really impressed me as well. Like I didn't, you know, for a guy myself who didn't, who hadn't seen him up until that point, just read about him. I liked what I saw, you know, very, very fluid skills. Yeah. What he was doing in the ring. And he was a well-rounded boxer. Not a you know superstar or anything, but a guy that clearly knew what he was doing and would give anybody fits. Yeah, he'd make your he'd make your night rough for sure. Yeah. No question. He had a very difficult style to deal with. Hall of Fame, unfortunately, I don't think he. I was. don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so, I just don't think that he's nearly on that level. Doesn't have nearly enough names to to justify that. But you, another guy you mentioned, Pongsik, like Wang Jong Cam, 
a guy who held the WBC flyweight title, which was also happened to be the lineal flyweight title, went mm -hmm. along with the WBC belt for a number of years. Um, but like you said, uh, the longevity was great, but largely defended the belt in Thailand Wednesdays, Thursday evenings yeah. at a cafe fucking open mic night whatever he didn't even give a fuck they were just getting opponents from where the fuck ever they didn't give a fuck but no, you know i liked him he was a he was a really entertaining fighter to watch uh good punching power he also and he also had some really big wins too like his first round knockout of um the dude who beat him japanese dude sorry naito daisuke naito like just massive that's especially at the time huge fucking knockout but um you know yeah, there's just a lot of holes right there. And he never unified. Okay, Kameda. Um, that was a big win for him too. But yeah, this yep. was like near the end. And then him losing the Sonny Boy uh Jaro and Yeah, he, one of just... the most massive, crazy, weird upsets because Jaro never went on to like, you know, do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just and oh. so there's there's some pretty big holes there, unfortunately. Ratanapol Sorvorpen, another guy that you mentioned earlier too. You know, I would there's... never vote for Sorvorpen. And he's a he's a fun fighter, man. Don't get me wrong. He was a he was a good fighter to watch and he was tough and all that. But if you look at his record of who he was defending against, I mean, it, you know, him and Ricardo Lopez were kind of trading off opponents a little bit. But Lopez clearly had the superior opposition at flyweight at, at strawweight, which is even kind of funny to say because like, again, like it was just absolute trash during back then. But like, yeah, but I'm sort of open. I'm not looking at his record, but by the time he gave up the belt, oh no, he got knocked out. Actually, that's what happened. He got knocked out and lost to Zelani Patello. Um, who was a uh, lanky South African, was way too big for the division. And um, loses that, moves up. He fights Will Grisby, who is a, um, an American junior flyweight, which is kind of an anomaly in itself. But good fighter, and you know, a good fighter from the late 90s, early 2000s, and um, gets outboxed in that one. And then soon after, after he loses that, um, fights Ricardo Lopez, you know, and kind of like an out, um, outdated battle of former fly uh strawweight champions and that was on an hbo pay-per-view it might have been hopkins uh tito or something i don't know one of those but um lopez just whooped him it was like that was i mean it was pure class like poor poor sore vorpin didn't have a chance he was just a flesh out of war in that fight lopez did what he wanted stopped him in three rounds and that was basically the end of him but yeah he's on the ballot but this brings me to the last guy i want to bring up I guess we can sum it up over here. And this might be our biggest surprise picks because I know we both voted for him, Jorge Arce. Yeah, dude, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, again, I think that I threw some votes out there that I probably would not have thrown out there on another ballot. You know, Absolutely. obviously. This is the first time I ever voted for Arce. This is the one that I was like, you know what? I'm going to look at something different and try to like look at really – dissect some records here and go through it and our says is one that made the cut you know i i would have i'm not saying i would have dismissed him before yes. but i wasn't necessarily considering him among my top to pick i mean there's a lot out there yeah. yeah but again it's a lot of it's the strength of the ballad the other pits etc 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 but when i finally kind of like went over his record again and was comparing it to some of the other fighters on there. I was like, you know what, dude, it does hold up. Hold it does. Up. Like he has a very good record and it actually goes back a little bit farther in terms of the top quality that, you know, it goes back into the nineties. And yes. a, a lot of people are only familiar with when he started kind of getting a little bit more. So Jorge, I'd say like for Americans, you know, they probably only recognized him after he started fighting on, I think it was HBO. Um, and you know, he made a couple of big appearances, especially against Hussein Hussein, you know, that was, uh, I fight fucking banged <laughs> dude. and First then fight. he, and then he just fucking folded him, just absolutely trounced him in the rematch, just like brutality status. And that was really when a lot of American fans took notice, but he was massive in Mexico. And one of the big reasons why was because he was on. I don't remember if it was the first season or like the second season, but the Mexican version of big brother. That's right. And he, That's and he was like, and he was like one of the big, you know, uh, uh, popular characters on that, on that show or whatever. And so he got massive in Mexico because of that. And, and also because he's a fucking warrior and he'd give blood and guts every time he got out there if he had to. And so anyway, point being that his, 
resume went farther back than I guess I just remembered. You know, when I started going over it, I was like, damn, it holds up. Totally does. I mean, that my first um, introduction to Arce, and I'm assuming yours as well, Pat, was when he fought the faded Michael Carvajal in 1999. Yep. Um, I'd say at this point was actually a WBO champion. Yeah, you know, and, um, still a teenager. He was like what nineteen. Almost years. pulled it off. Just ran oh. out of gas. What a fight that was too. Carvajal, you know, obviously he's a Hall of Famer. We've talked about him countless times in the show before and other stuff. Top so five I mullet in boxing, no question. Yeah, man. I mean, just and one of my favorite fighters growing up. I loved watching Carvajal because my dad liked Carvajal. So I, anything my dad liked, I liked. But like. You couldn't help but like Carvajal. He was a, clearly a great fighter. Punched as hard as a fucking rock back then. And oh, and just put everything into it too. Just yeah. like but was chucking. Like not like effortlessly, but like ah! you know, he, he was take fucking chucking. He's gonna take you out. You know what I mean? Like, and sure he had to fight some really, really tough dudes back then, like Melcher or Cobb Castro and others that he couldn't knock out. But if he could take you out, he was gonna blast you. And most of those little guys back then were just being terrorized by little hands of stone. So, um, by 1999, Carvajal, who, who had a number of wars in the ring and was also had a lot of outside the ring issues that had come full circle at this point in his career, was a, a spent bullet. Definitely a spent bullet. So by the time he fights Jorge Arce, he just had one last hurrah on him. It was, it just, I forgot what pay per view it was. It was one of those, like, um, I think actually Eric Morales might have been like the it headline. It might have been. It was yeah. It was like the either the co-feature or the undercard or something. It was yeah. It wasn't the HBO. It wasn't the HBO or Showtime produced. It was like one of those like top rank off brand. You know whatever. But yeah. Regardless, um, that was Arce. And Arce was beating the shit out of Kabbalah on that fight. Like you know, Arce was young, full of vinegar, you know, full of vigor and piss and vinegar, whatever you want to say. Yeah. They're kind of really? talking about like, oh, well, finally, Michael Carbajal has reached the point of his career type of thing, you know, the commentating. Yeah. And Carbajal always had a good chin. I mean, he was decked a couple of times against Chiquita Gonzalez and others, but he was never a guy that was ever knocked out. So he was taking the punishment, but he was getting beat up and he was, his face to get puffy and bloodied and worn out. And he's just a step behind. Every time he tries to unload a shot, he's just a step behind, you know, and Arce is whooping him but. Near the end of the fight, like you said, man, Arce starting to slow down because he was putting on a breakneck pace, and Carvajal still has that power. In a round leg, what was it that he stopped him? Around eleven, round ten, he just, wow, he just caught him with that one shot. Arce just completely became unglued, you know. And if one thing Carvajal still had left in him, he was still a finisher, and obviously finished off Arce. And um, that was the best finish you can think of for his career because Carvajal immediately realized he had nothing left and retired right after that fight, and. You know, Arce showed to himself that you're like, what? He's still a kid. He fought a future Hall of Famer and a legend, yep. was whooping on him until then. So he's had plenty of life left in him. And he clearly did because after a number of victories against, you know, different fight, um, just, uh, you know, a few guys, nothing, nothing really major, stuff like that. The biggest name, I guess, would be Camelo uh, Caceres, who fought for a world title a couple of times. And um, Juanito Rubiar for that, for example. He ends up fighting in 2002, Yosam Choi. Um, Yosam Choi was the fight, a Korean fighter who actually defeated um, Saman Shorjatarong for the WBC uh, Junior Flyweight Championship. And Shorjatarong was the guy that ended up uh, ended Shakita Gonzalez's career in the 90s. After he knocked him out, he went on a nice long run himself of like a dozen or so defenses. Really tough guy. Not a great boxer, but a guy that had tremendous power and came into his own for a while. So when Choi was able to beat him and then subsequently knock him out in a rematch, um, people were looking at Choi as like a guy that was a top dog in the division, and rightfully so, you know. And um, Arce thrashed him in that fight, just absolutely, you know, he went to seal, went to Seoul to fight him and just whooped him, just stopped him, beat the shit out of him. Um, Choi, unfortunately, had an ill-fated ending to his life and career soon after that. But, I mean, that was a huge win for Arce. And an underrated win, too, when you look back at his body of work. But... Like, you you know, Pat, like you said, man, that was the start of him, too, for his run, you know? Yeah, and to think that he was just a young dude with so much potential at that time, too, um, you know, to it was really uh, that Carbajal fight's a learning experience, no question. And he only went on to become much greater from that point without question, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just I <laughs> with a little bit of prodding from our homeboy Gray Johnson, too, just some reminding that Jorge Arce really was the, you know, the great fighter that he was. Um, but, you know, 
I, I do it, I guess on some level, the entertainment value does kind of creep into the equation too. Um, it was entertaining as hell. And you got to, you know what, Sue, like the thing about him before we get into like his super entertaining fights that every, everybody remembered, I almost, now looking at his record, you almost think of him as like Terry Norris in the sense that, you know how Norris wiped out the the guys from the 80s, the retreads of the 80s that were still around. He took out um, Donald Curry, took out Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, um, stuff like that, right? John Mugabe, as he was like solidifying himself. Arce took out guys like Melchor Cobb Castro. He took out um, uh, Joma Gamboa, who was a former champion from strawweight. Um, you know, uh, Rosendo Alvarez. These were all guys that were champions or contenders, you know, as strawweight and junior flyweight in the 90s, early 90s, mid 90s, whatever it was. They were still hanging on there. Lopez had retired at this point. You know, um, Carbajal, Chiquita Gonzalez had retired at this point, but these were still guys that were from that era. And now Arce was like putting them in the permanent retirement after this. Yeah, exactly. Ushering in the new era or whatever, just to make sure that they knew like the young guns ain't going to have them anymore, you know, and, and definitely Arce was, uh, well, more of more than a gatekeeper for sure, but definitely the kind of fighter where if you were an older fighter, he was going to make you realize that it was time. Mm -hmm. No question. Absolutely. No question. And I mean, in the fight that you mentioned too, probably his most exciting fight. Uh, I don't remember what undercard it was on, but it was his first fight with um, the the fighter Hussein Hussein, which I mean, dude. I... Um, believe it or not, I think that was actually Morales Pacquiao won. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're and right. So, so needless to say, that shit was like a fucking amazing card. I remember that shit. That shit was like, oh my god, fucking you know, Morales. Like... Morales and that was one of those things that, like, um, Arce cut on the nose, cut everywhere, um, scores or rallies and scores a, you know, a tremendous knockout at the end. And then you have him, like, afterwards in those famous photos of him wearing the cowboy hat. And he's, like, you know, with blood still on his face. And he's just cheering. That's when you just, like, you got to love this guy. You know what I mean? He was just, like, he was he was a blood and guts warrior. You fight for your entertainment. They didn't even fuck how much blood he would drop as long as he was still going to score that knockout on you, too. Like, incredible. Yeah, and then... And then the the rematch, uh, I, I was there for the rematch. I just don't remember what card it was. Oh, what... it, was the, it was the rematch of, um, and this is what, what makes this really disappointing too when you think about it. Because they thought, you know, Showtime, and rightfully so, they thought they were doing something with this. There was the re, it was the undercard of, um, uh, Cor of Corrales Castillo too. So you think you got Corrales there Castillo, go, yeah. too, which is one of the greatest fights in history. Then you're going to put... Jorge Arce, Hussein Hussein, too, on the undercard of that because I mean that fight was a banger itself, and you're like, yeah, man, this you know that fight ends up becoming an absolute blowout. Corrales Castillo too was a blowout of itself for a variety of fucking fucked up reasons. Yeah, bro, <laughs> that whole card is kind of like, <laughs> yeah, it was a mess. And on top of yeah, it and it makes sense that I wouldn't remember that too because I was so fucking drunk that entire time <laughs> in Vegas, bro. Like yeah. like embarrassingly drunk, so it totally makes sense that I don't remember that. But I do remember that I'd say fucking rode in on a horse for the rematch. He fucking yeah. rode in on a horse and he had his fucking sucker and shit. Yeah, I remember that shit. So apparently, I do remember. I wasn't that drunk. I remember enough of that. But yeah, um, that yeah. was obviously part of his entertainment value, though, dude. The guy was uh, he was uh, an entertainer inside and outside the ring. He was, but you have to take into account, too, we're mentioning all of his wins over here and stuff, but, like, a lot of his biggest fights, and that's why people say, oh, you know, I'm not sure if you put him for the Hall of Fame, because if you see, like, some of his big wins, they were, like, for interim titles and things like that, and then when he finally had, like, a high-profile marquee fight, whether it be against, you know, one of my favorites, Victor Chinian, or um, Christian Mahares, who's an underrated guy from that era, you know, he ends up losing. You know what I mean? And sometimes he didn't get stopped or he lose like a competitive decision or whatever it was. But like a few of those fights, you know, the biggest ones that he could have absolutely helped him push him ahead in terms of being a Hall of Famer, he ended up losing. But, you know, he had such, like you said, Pat, he has such longevity though in his career because like fights that you would think, okay, he got whooped up in the Bar in the Darchinian fight. Like that wasn't really competitive and he got stopped. Um, he got outboxed comprehensively against Christian Mahares. And you would think because of his style and the way he was everything like that, that he would probably fade away. But, 
you know, instead, no, he came back. He knocked out Martin Castillo, who was a former champion. Lorenzo Parra, who was a former long, um, long-term champion. Yep. Both of and, them, Parra and Castillo, were fighters that a lot of people thought would go a lot farther than they did. You know, so it's like, yeah, those were good wins. And then when he fought uh, Wilfredo Vasquez Jr., who was undefeated at that point in 2011, or known thought to be a rising star in the division, and who had a tremendous knockout, I think, of against uh, was it Marvin Sansona to win the belt originally? I think so yeah, he was he was on the way up. Arce that fight against Arce, who was a small guy compared to a fucking person like um, uh, Vasquez Junior. Junior Junior featherweight, like serious. You know, this was not a fight Arce was supposed to win. This was going to be like a nice recognizable name that Vasquez was going to put on his ledger. You know, move on. Yeah, to it was supposed to be out with the old and with the new shit is what it's supposed to be. It was, it was basically supposed to be fucking Arce Carbajal is what it's supposed to be. And instead, man, Arce put on one of his best performances. Man, that was incredible, dude. He was get, he got hit with some shit too. It was a really yeah, it was good, a war. Arce got dropped. You know, Vasquez was putting it on him, but Arce's will came over, man. And by the end of the fight, when he finally started really wailing on Vasquez Jr., had him in the corner, and Vasquez getting wailed around, you know, and and the fight gets stopped. And then you see dramatically Wilfredo Vasquez Sr., his dad, come into the ring and just kind of go like enough like that and grab his kid and just kind of like, you know, embrace him. It's like, damn, you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. that's 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 the thing that again that you can push Arce for the Hall of Fame because like had he had he just disappeared after um the Darchinian fight, and if he did, he still would have had a hell of a career that he could have been very proud of. But no one would have even thought twice about putting him in there. But it was like the second you know coming back, being in Vasquez Jr. Who I mean, look, it's not like the Hall of Famer himself, but just the fact that he he was able to do that. It was a big win, a huge upset. Became champion again. Um, he fights Simfonwi Naga. You, Sim, you, Sim Piwe, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. but that was a that was a revenge win too because he got beat before and then that was his revenge win. Totally. So you know, like, I mean, I would say up until when he finally loses to Johnny Gonzalez was on a nice little tear himself. I mean, besides Donair as well, like Donair, eh, well, <laughs> that doesn't count because obviously Donair knocks everybody else out. But like, I would say. He's up there. If you compare his record and his bat and and his uh, list of accomplishments compared to other guys on the ballot, he deserves at least a mention. And on a un- uh, lean year like this, a check mark for me. So. Yeah, and so I think that he's I think that he's got he's got a fucking uh, an argument for it there for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And I so the longevity is better than I thought it was for our say. And I allowed myself to be convinced for sure, <laughs> without question. But yeah, um, what's well, up? So that being said, what was your top five? What was your picks? So all right, yeah. So I was actually good call because I was gonna say we should run down what our picks are just in case because we kind of jumped all over the fucking place because we're dumbasses. But so my <laughs> my five picks were Jorge Arce, Santos, Laciar, uh, Rafa Marquez, Michael Nunn, and Hilberto Roman. So apparently I got like a, a, a definitely a Latino bias on this one. Same with me because I picked Gilberto Roman. I picked um, Carl Froch. I picked um, um, Jorge Arce, Michael Nunn, and then Rafael Marquez. So, so and who a- do I think is going to get in this year? I think Tim Bradley's going to get in. Um, I think Froch might have a good chance of getting in this year. And probably Marquez would be my third pick. You know, actually, before we get before we go, there was another name too that I did notice a couple people mention as far as wanting to pick. I'm not sure if they wound up picking him, that I was I was a little surprised, and that's Yuel Casamayor. I saw a you couple know, people mention at his record too, man. If he, dude Casamayor has an as an incredible resume himself, and that was a dude that shied away from nobody. Um, and that's the one you have to actually bring up to. To, to get the full, you know, appreciation of it, you have to look at it. Like, from when he became champion and, you know, to when he finally retired after losing to Tim Bradley, dude, just just look at who he fought. There's, there's, you know, but there's a couple of names in there that don't really belong, but, like, for instance... Um, a lot of people thought he beat Ocelino Freitas back in the day. Yes, absolutely, you know. Um, when he first becomes champion, excuse me, in the... Uh, around 2000, beating John Quan Beck, 
you know, um, undefeated Radford Beasley, who a lot of people were really high on, um, finishes, uh, finishes Robert Garcia's career. And that was a really tough fight. Garcia was given the business early on before Casamayor came in and stopped him. Um, like you said, the Asselino Freitas fight that a lot of people thought he might have won. And that became the trademark for him, man, is that like a lot of those fights, had he won those fights, he would have been in the Hall of Fame by now. Because had he beat Freitas, that was a fight, flip a coin. Yeah, unification right. fight. And I remember that was big at the time, too. That was a really big fight. And then he's, um, fast forward a couple of years, he takes on an undefeated Nate Campbell, who had just debuted on HBO pay-per-view, knocking the shit out of Daniel Alisayer, and everybody was really excited about him. Casamayor fights him on the undercard of um, Vernon Forrest, uh, Mayorga. Yep. And he didn't have to fight him. You know what I mean? No one was like... Yeah, active. it was like a 10-round non-title fucking, was, yeah. No one was actively trying to fight Nate Campbell at that point, and rightfully so, because Campbell was on a fucking tear. And Casamayor fought him and in a very close fight, scored a decision on him. His very next fight is Diego Corrales. Like, this is the type of dude that Casamayor was, you know what I mean? And, and in that fight, too, like, Casamayor gets dropped. That's a hell of a fight. Casamayor gets dropped, comes back, drops Corrales, and then Corrales, because he had that funky mouthpiece, just, you know, his whole mouth was shredded up like fucking tissue paper and um, ends up getting stopped in it. But, you know, that was the thing. And he fights Corrales in an immediate rematch. After fighting, after fighting a guy like Corrales in their first fight, getting dropped, you know, stopping him like that, most guys would be like, oh, I'm moving on to something else. I don't need to fight him again. He had no problem fighting him in an immediate rematch and then even losing in that one. And then when he fought Castillo in 2004, same thing, Pat, right? A lot of people would say coin flip who won that fight. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people I remember at the time believed that Casameo should have gotten it, but, you know, that Castillo with this pressure, you know, you could probably understand... Yeah, he actually did a lot of really good body punching in that fight too. Castillo did, but uh, which that should come as no surprise in this instance. Yeah. But that was that wound up being, like you said, kind of his signature, his trademark, where Casimir could hold it close with a lot of fighters, but maybe just not quite pull it out, you know, because he wasn't he wasn't a big puncher. He was more of a stylist kind of boxer puncher type of guy. And then after that fight, Alzma Beck ran cool off Kid Diamond. Kid Diamond, dude. Kid D. I, I remember Kid D. People he went absolutely ready. nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. But when he first came on the scene. Yeah, side, but people were high, high on that motherfucker. Very high on him because he had, a, he had a couple of high profile wins where he just fucking whooped on yeah. someone. I think and he scored a really convincing one of Emmanuel Augustus and he beat some other guys up. But yeah. like, he gets on HBO. Cast, and again, Casamayor is that one dude. I'll step up and fight him. No one was trying to fight Rain Kulov like that. I mean, Nate Campbell ruined him. But like before then, no one was trying to step up to him. Casamayor was like, I'll do it. Fuck it. And then fights a close fight that he probably should have won that fight too. It ends up being a draw. And then he finally gets his luck turn when he fights Castillo, uh, Castillo um, Corrales in their third fight and wins the decision. Now becomes lightweight champion, right? Yeah. And at this point, in 2006, he's past it. You know what I mean? He's a... He had an incredibly long amateur career. Look yeah. at the pace he's fought as a pro, all the guys he's fought as pro. And after he beats Corrales, he had that bullshit win against our Jose Armando Santa Cruz, which um, clearly anybody... Yeah, a, a very bad robbery, for sure. But his next fight after that, and this is probably you know um, the last big win of his career, one of the best wins of his career, against Michael Casitas. Yep. Yeah, that was a massive fight, dude. That was an extremely fun war that, you know, one of those kinds of fights that actually doesn't get mentioned among a lot of the wars, but was a fucking great fight. It was a great fight. Uh, great you know, fight. he wound up pulling that shit out. And uh, yeah, dude, I mean, that was probably his last massive hurrah or whatever. And after that, he was kind of just a uh, used up cannon fodder for the most part. But you bringing up Ram Kulov, dude, that reminds me. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that dude in forever. We interviewed that guy on Max Boxing, and that guy was talking about some funny shit because he was working out. I'm pretty sure it was at Wild Card. I'm almost positive as a Wild Card. Wild and card. he was talking about how everybody was going like, oh, yeah, what's up, dog? How you doing, dog? And he was getting pissed at first when he first came to the U.S. because he didn't understand that that was the vernacular. And he thought people yeah, were yeah. calling him a dog, like a canine. And that he was starting to, he was like trying to fight people and shit because he thought people were calling him a dog. And mm -hmm. so he was trying to explain that to us during his interview because we were like, how, you know, 
how how is it how is the u.s different or some shit like that and he was explaining how like it took him a while to get the speech and shit like that he was big for a bit dude a lot of people totally forgot about that guy at this point but for for like a year and a half dude was considered hot but yeah. Casimir put the fucking kibosh on that shit that's for sure or at sure. least at least he cooled it down no question yeah um i saw a couple people mention him i was a little surprised i didn't really expect to see that to him you know him being brought up even as a possibility so look dude it's a it's a wide open ballot this year um i'm actually i'm not like excited well no i am excited but i am kind of curious. Next year, you gotta be excited uh, i'm excited at, at the vote for myself but i'm curious to see who winds up getting in because i think this is the first year that i voted where it's mm-hmm. like it's kind of like i don't know like i mean i think that there's probably one maybe two names like you said i think tim bradley's gonna probably gonna be like the shoe in or whatever but then beyond that it's like it's kind of a a little bit of a toss-up it's gonna be interesting man and sometimes those years are the best ones yeah so i really i'm really hoping i guarantee you the popularity will not be the same as it was this past year for in terms of like attendance and all that. So yeah. if you're trying to go, this might be a good year for you if you want to get your feet wet and really have an opportunity to like sit or down. Or if you and... don't like crowds. Yeah, or, yeah. Or if you want to have a more intimate setting but not have to be fighting people to like, you know, say hi to a champion or something like that. Yeah, for sure. But we'll be there. I'm going to be there. I'm saying that this time because I am going to fucking be there. Yeah. I think you better be, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, this time I'm going to be there. We're going to figure out some fun shit to do. But um, now, look, it's it's always fun for me to do the voting. I'm really happy that I I'm really honored to be taking place, you know, taking part in the voting and stuff like that and being a voter. Um, Yeah. So I know you and I both take it seriously and try to put sure. thought into it. So, dude, I appreciate you doing your work, man. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, everybody who listened in to this show, thank you so much. Uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, whatever app it is you listen on to, we appreciate that. Leave us a comment, leave us a rating. If you watched on YouTube, thanks again. Thanks so much. Also subscribe, leave us a comment. We'll try to reply. We're jumping back in. We're jumping back in. We took a break, but we're jumping back in. All right. Thanks so much. But uh, yeah, if, as far as the podcast goes, we're on social media, Facebook and Instagram, but also on Twitter and also individually we're on Twitter. Eris Pina is on Twitter as punch zone. Eris. I'm there as Patrick M. Connor. Say hello, Eris. Talk to you soon, bro. Have a good one, everyone. Later, everybody.